board. Okay. And then it was like, oh, it's a message board and it's like a MySpace page sort of concept. And now it's sort of morphed and evolved. Like they're trying, I think, to become sort of like a hybrid of like social network and like a Patreon sort of thing. Like, okay. Brian, are you familiar with it? Uh, I'm not. What is it? Uh, it says deviantart.com. Uh, you say, say that again. Deviant art. Deviant art. Okay. One word. Com. Yeah, it's like they host like a ton of. Uh, I mean, it's it's just a, like a massive um, uh, art centric uh, like portfolio type of site. That's cool. Um, kind of like how you were talking about with like SoundCloud and and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. That. Um, you know, like all uh, places on the web, like you got popular for a while and then it dropped off for a while and then it'll get popular. For, like, so it's, it always bounces back and forth with that space, but Sweet. it's easy to use. Like you don't have to know a lot. Like it's very user-friendly like mm -hmm. for me to like throw stuff on and do so uh, it works, you know, yeah. and, and it's been around along like um, in the past, they used to do things like th that, that company would sponsor like, uh, like Artist Alley Space, like New York Comic Con or okay. San Diego Comic Con. Like they do have some sort of money behind them. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so you've been here for 14 years as part of this site. That's wild. It's oh, there are people time. like way longer than me because it's been around a lot longer. Wow. Um, but like everybody jumps around. Like as, as soon as people started wanting to create a blog or a website, they went and did that. And then they're like, Oh, that's a that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. And then they go, you know, or like, oh, now I have an Etsy store, so I want to drive you all to Etsy or Shopify, which is great. But fans don't move that way. Like, like everybody kind of right. just like, yeah, oh, that's where I live, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. Robert, are you there? Can you yep, I'm that? here. Okay. Uh, you Am may I not showing up on video. Now you may have to turn your camera on. It's probably got a little uh, it's on at the bottom of your screen towards the left. Has a red line through it, probably. Yep. Oh, there we uh, go. Cool. What's up, man? Not uh, too much. How's everybody there we doing? Go. Good. Uh, we got Ryan. Say hello there, Ryan. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> How are you, uh, Robin? Right. Robin. Yes. Uh, it's nice to meet I you. Was Robin. Named after uh, Batman. Nice. Batman and Robin. My dad had a very great sense of humor. Yeah, I love it. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I've met people who name their their child Robin, but they go with Christopher Robin from Winnie the Pooh. Oh, Gosh. yeah. Yeah, it's like, so that's like a deep literary pull. Everyone's like, "Oh, Batman Robin!" I'm like, no, you Philistine. Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, my my two kids are named after uh, Lyra is named after uh, uh, the Golden Compass. Right. And uh, Charlie for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, I was waiting for like Lord Azrael. Yeah, oh man, that would, yeah, that would have been good as well. Serafina <laughs> Pecola, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, we were just talking about Robin, we were just talking about DeviantArt. Um, I didn't know it existed until five minutes ago when I was clicking through some of Tom's stuff. And uh, he's been a member for 14 years, it seems like. Put a stuff on him. <laughs> Who do we got here, Jamie? Oh, well, that's is, uh, Chad. Chad, yeah. I probably didn't change my name either. It may call me Jessica or something stupid. <laughs> no, no, no. It calls you it calls you Chumley. Who? Oh. <laughs> he may need to do the same thing video wise. Oh yeah. Usually when you log on, it's default video off, I think. Yeah, it is. Good call. I think I can change that on my end, but um, I should probably do that for future times, but I mean, video off is a good idea until people are ready, you know, all that yeah. good stuff. <laughs> it's, for me, the thing that usually throws me is usually the audio starts off a lot of times too. There, 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 yeah. there we go. Oh, there you go. Can you hear us? I sure can. Can you guys hear me okay? I can. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, all you gentlemen look phenomenal tonight, just so uh, so we're on the record. Nice. Hey, you, you as well. <laughs> I'm Ryan. Hi, I'm Chad. Chad, it's nice to meet you. It's yeah, a pleasure, it guys. Thank you so much for having us tonight. 
He is my other better half. <laughs> Bet, Better is an overstatement, I, I would guarantee. Well, I'm Justin, and this is uh, Tom Kelly here with us as well. Um, we were actually, we just got started, but randomly before we started, I was uh, clicking through some of Tom's art, ended up at VPN Art, not to repeat myself here, but um, I wasn't aware of it. It's been around forever, but it's, it's pretty sweet. Are you guys a part of that site? Are you familiar with it? I, I have the app. I yeah, DeviantArt. Yeah, DeviantArt. I think yeah. we, both of us have the app, but we haven't, uh, like, I haven't posted anything on there because I'm not very computer savvy. Um, so, like, apps and stuff, I, I I try to use social media and all that stuff to, to promote. You know, the, 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 the funny art thing, though, is, like, I've been on it so long, it was, like, from the days of the hard drive, like, the mm -hmm. old desktop setup. So, like, I have the app, too, and I never really use it on my phone and stuff. I'm always either on my laptop or, like, my home setup. It's... Yeah. Can you can, can you order prints from the website and then yeah. have and then have the artist get a cut of that? Yeah. I mean, they, they have it set up where there's, like, a storefront that you can include into your page. So, you can selectively choose, like... Uh, what thing like what prints or what pieces of art because it's not just like prints like there's a lot of people that make sculpture and fibers like yeah I'm, I'm just it's an international, that. like art right. community so it's a lot of stuff um so yeah uh usually the main rule is uh because they like to protect themselves they don't want any like copyrighted characters so yes. original stuff yeah, I, that's you can totally like. Oh, hey Tom, I love that print of your creator own thing. Yeah, you can go and get that. But if you like want an, uh, a Batman print or something, then you got to kind of like message me. That's something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it can still happen. It just I can't do it through their site because they don't want to, you know, deal with that stuff. I have your, uh, and that's how I learned about you. I got your Skeletor, Snake Mountain, and E Man oh, cool. print. Yeah. <laughs> Make nice. it fanatic, man. Yes, that's that's perfect. Crown. We got uh, Battle Cat, and there's several of them right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was, uh, you know, it was funny. I was in the Target today, and they uh, they were selling the new updated uh, Battle Cat figures. E man stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also have a few of the uh, weird Masters of the Universe Justice League uh, uh, style ones. I, I have a Beta Ray Bill, um, uh, like, action figure who's about He-Man size, and, and, like, he fits the Ace the Bat Hound perfectly that they made for that. So it's a very <laughs> weird thing that I have. It's, like, you know, it's like, I don't have a ton of action figures, but I have these weird things that work. But, yeah, the He-Man yeah. ones. And the, the thing with that... Uh, the Skeletor one, too, is really funny because I didn't make a lot of those because, oddly enough, the villain doesn't sell as much as, as the hero. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you have the Skeletor one, you have kind of the deep cut. Like, you opted for both because if not... I can see that. that at all. <laughs> can you see the screen? I can see uh, some of it. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, it's sort of messy. I tried. Here, here, let me try it on my end. You got to make me stop because now. Yeah, I no. I, I, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> there you are. That's right. I was looking at it. I was like, oh, I'll just let them look at it. Oh, they all have computers. They can pull it up if they want. It's, That's it's, true. It's, it's pretty badass. It's on my wall. But I mean, I used to be on um, like the Pencil Jack online forums. And um, uh, things like Jinx World and stuff, like like the Bendis board, okay. like, like back when it was almost like pure news groups. Oh, there you go. There we go. And so it's yeah, like so like I've always tried to be online in different communities, right? But at a certain point, you kind of hop around, and you're just like. What works like, the best? Like oversaturated, just to yeah. that point where there's so many different platforms you can use. It's just 
Well, everybody jumps around. That's that's sort of the thing because everybody wants to go to the site where all the cool kids are at, or where like oh that's where the money's at, or what like whatever. Like I mean, right. you see it with like Facebook and and Instagram and like um like what's like, it's like like TikTok and like you, you watch everybody sort of jump from social network and try to be on the hot one that month or that year so that they can get all the views and, and get monetized. And, you know, I understand that, but at a certain point, you're just going from one grocery line to the, like the slightly shorter grocery, like the other cash register. And really you're just like, you're not getting, you're not going forward. You're just changing lanes a lot. That's, that's really it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's um, I, I literally live that life as a guy who writes uh, at least semi decently, but doesn't have the artistic talent of people like yourself and Robin. Uh, I spend an extensive amount of time surfing the fibers of the world, the deviant oh. arts of the world, the artists and clients of the world, and and it, exactly like what you're uh, kind of speaking to. I have s seen so many different experiences of. Uh, for one week, fiber is the hot thing. And if you're there, you're going to find the top of the food chain artist. And then a week later, you come back and look and you send an email to somebody and you don't hear anything back from them for like two weeks. And you're going, is anyone still here? I feel like I'm the yeah. only guy still surfing. And they all moved on to artists and clients because it doesn't take wow. as big a cut of the artist's uh, commission once they get Well, to I mean, the cut is definitely part of it. But it also is like, it's that fear of missing out. Like, if all the cool kids are at the McDonald's and you're at the Taco Bell on Friday night, God damn, you're not getting laid. So you better get over to the McDonald's, you know? It's like, <laughs> there's a lot of that sort of going on because, I mean, like, like the best thing that happened to the animation industry was like YouTube setting a video format so that you just upload your demo reel and you're like, there it is you don't have to send anybody like a tape and hope that you followed all the directions right. Or worse, you're the person like getting the tapes going like, oh, okay, this, this fucker screwed it up. This guy did it wrong. I, you know, it's like, like demo reels were like nightmares and they were expensive. And now it's like, just put it on YouTube, send me your stupid link. We know the link that's going to be like, just make it this and, and there, you know, like, yeah, it's, yeah, we're our own worst best enemies when we try to promote and 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 be around places, but we're also sort of like, like I know a lot of people who are like, oh man, I don't I don't like that site, I, I don't like it. It doesn't seem like there's anybody on it. I'm like, well, there's nobody on it because everybody's afraid when they get there that they went to the wrong party. Like, oh, their friend gave them the address to the other house. Like, oh, the nerds go to the lame house and all the cool, you know, it's like, like, no, man, like, if you don't sit there for 10 minutes, nobody's ever going to show up. But, you know, you. <laughs> well, I think I, I, to, I, to, to, to what you're saying, there's like, it, I think uh, every party starts with a single person. So, uh, so you're absolutely 100% right that. Somebody, yeah, there he is, <laughs> said, I'm the guy. Once I start it, then people start coming to rock in for the, for the overall operation. And it's, uh, some of them are fleeting. They're a week long, a day long, a couple days long. But, but regardless of how it kind of all works out, we find ourselves in a position where, you know, you're jumping into, ah, this is where everybody's at today. And I have to just understand that a day or two from now, they may all be have moved on to somewhere else. Would uh, would you say that this uh, community is fairly close knit? I mean, are, are you able to predict where people are going to go, or is it, or is it does that quite does that make sense? Like like how how can you you know the new sites that are coming up and maybe the new venues that you can utilize that are at your disposal? But I mean. Can you make an educated guess about where to go? I guess is what I'm saying. I personally, for me, I go by the premise that people are lazy, mm -hmm. like really, really lazy. So chances are once they sort of find a spot, they're not going to give it up until something kind of forces them to leave. 
So like it, it sounds weird, but like Facebook is still kind of a very robust space mm -hmm. of like connecting with people. And when you dig into like the actual group function that's in there, you can find a lot of like comic books and creators and writers and musicians and like other folks. That for sure. Are. Yeah, I'm I mean, involved in a few communities like that, not for comic books, I mean, but for other yeah, artists. Probably, yeah. I would say probably after that is maybe like Instagram mm -hmm. because that seems to like be like the middle child of like, it's still useful. A lot of people still post on it, but it's not as, uh, as interactable because you can't, uh, you have to message people on it like through it you can't just like post and cross tag and get into crazy arguments which is like great because it's you don't get that stuff but it's also like you know slows down the interaction so mm -hmm. um the rest of that stuff whether it's like TikTok, uh tiktok or twitch or youtube or whatever i mean it's kind of like pokemon you got to catch them all like you kind of got to balance like, where do I want to spend some of my time every day? I mean, for me, like, as trying to promote, yeah. like, when I'm just, like, doing stuff and I don't want to talk to anybody, yeah, like, message me through, like, Facebook or shoot me, like, a text or something, and that's how I interact yeah. with people. And that makes sense. I mean, that's, that yeah. answers my question. You, just, you have to catch them all. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, though. On some level. I'm never switching to Spotify. They can go fuck themselves. I'll never watch Joe Rogan again if I don't have. You know what I mean? Fuck them. I refuse. I'm that old, oh, yeah. old guy I mean, now. They can fuck right off. <laughs> it's, you know, it's too complicated. I got that. <laughs> yeah. well, well, I know as a, as a new business trying to start up and, and navigate this uh, landmark space, I'm not, I'm not sure how old everyone is on the call, but I'm a 36-year-old guy. Robin, as our director of, of art uh, within Battleborn Comics, is a little bit older than myself. I'm 41, uh, so. 41. Oh, I, I don't want to put too much on him. But, uh, <laughs> but, with, the, <laughs> but with those things in mind, the this whole uh, uh, digital medium has become such a such an interesting challenge for us as an organization because yeah. we're military guys. Uh, oh, my yeah, responsibility right. when I was in the military was I shoot people in the face. I kick indoors, I shoot people in the face. That's it. So now you're in this, this world where you have to be able to interface with the clientele where they are. You don't get the opportunity for them to come sit in my driveway and me talk to them about Battlemore Comics. I have to find them. Yeah. And this new generation really functions heavily in this, uh, this digital realm. So Robin and I have had a very interesting journey as it pertains to setting up Facebook accounts, which I think we both did at like, I don't know, August-ish of last year. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to gain a clientele, a fan following, and friends uh, that we can then lean on to say, hey, new book coming out. We got a new issue. It's on Let's the, get the it's word on out. The Are you guys interested? Yeah. Tell us what you guys' thoughts are. Yeah. Um, that because that's what this is. This industry now has become. It's not necessarily about the client, uh, the the uh, product that you put out, right? There's a there's a lot of people that put out great products that no one ever hears of. Yeah. It's about not only being able to put out a quality product, but also uh, to find your clientele and hit them exactly where they are in the industry. Yeah, understand the community. It's yeah, complicated. it seems to be dried up now too, right? Because of COVID, it's kind of shut down a lot of the, you know, expos and your San Diego cons and stuff like that, right? So oh that, man, yeah, that, that hurt us bad. Back. Well, it absolutely did. You know, we we, we were plotting uh we were plotting books and brew tours this year. So our oh, cool. so Battleborn Comics uh launching in February of 2020, our focus was we wanted to take a very intimate setting. We wanted to uh, partner with local comic shops, local artists, and we wanted to function under a books and brew tour. Uh, I'm a drinker. My wife's a drinker. I don't know how many of you guys are drinkers, but I think that's a, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I love that. So, cheers. so our, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cheers. So, so our whole idea or function was, we wanted to go link up with local breweries and the communities that we were going oh, yeah. to be functioning in, bring in comics, 
local oh, yeah. comic book stores, uh, local artists who have amazing, you know, Batman and Superman and whatever, DC, Marvel, Image functions that they could bring in, cool pictures <laughs> that they would sell. And we would create this really cool network and a little bit of nostalgia, honestly, um, for people to come oh, for in. Sure have some drinks, hang out with your buddies and check out comics. And the big hope in, in the, the midst of all that was that somehow Battleborn Comics gets brought up and we have an opportunity to kind of grow our fan base with this very organic opportunity. Um, but that's something that we are looking into as, the, as 2021 kind of hits us. We're just waiting on uh, people to get comfortable. Uh, I'm in Alabama. I know Robin's in Indiana. And uh, trying to get into this space where we have a large enough person, a group of personnel that the uh, industry has interest in coming out for those kinds of things. Because it's still weird when you say, hey, yeah. we want 50 people in a building. People kind yeah. of raise their eyebrows and go, you know, there's Fringe. a pandemic going on, right? Yeah. And we don't even know what the market's going to look like in six months at this point. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a lot of biding our time. <laughs> One million percent. Yeah, and talking to a lot of comic book shops around here, they're they're a little uh, hesitant to buy independent comics because that takes a chunk out of their profit if they're gambling on something. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of these comic book shops are super dependent on people coming in and not just uh, ordering like subscriptions through them, but like coming in and buying off the shelf and everything. Browsing. And with the pandemic hit, they they're they're very, very cautious and uh, they want, hey, do you have multiple issues? Do you have uh, something I can, is the story good enough? Can I, can I get a read of it first? And Hope we didn't um, upset. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm already bored with, with all this uh, talk <laughs> business. <laughs> hey, this is long form. We gotta, we're in it for the long haul. <laughs> Oh, the internet likes to have fun with me. Don't don't mind me. Don't tell me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I agree what you're what you're saying. I mean, the community aspect of of starting in your area and and doing stuff with like bars and comic shops and 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 brewer especially breweries. It's funny. Um, I'm based here out of Chicago, and um, even even the main show C two E two that Reed Pop puts on. Yep. They partner with, um, oh, the one brewery here, uh, Half Acre. Okay. They have like a specific beer called uh, um, something hero, anti-hero or something like that. Tom, Tom, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. Where are you in Chicago or in, in, in the Illinois space? Oh, I, I, I am... just left there in August. I was out oh. there for two weeks for a competition I was a part of. Oh, okay. Uh, I live in uh, the downtown area of Chicago. I live in what's yeah. called the Ukrainian Village section, yeah. right by like Humboldt Park and Wicker Yeah, Park. absolutely. <laughs> very, very cool. I stayed in an Airbnb that was not too far from that area uh, mm -hmm. for two weeks. I, I, I uh, entered into the Flip the Script competition. Oh. And uh, I actually, it, it was like a, they, they wanted it to be a season one of a reality show, which was oh, okay. literally... Here's a, here's a script concept, a theme, right. write something, and then we're going to send you through this crazy process. I made it to the finals. I won the best script, and yeah, I got yeah. the opportunity to direct my first short, which was really cool, nice. uh, but it was right there in Chicago, so super awesome. Chicago's cool. a great town. What was this called? Oh, What's that? Fun. What was it called? Flip the it script. was called Flip, Flip the Script Season 1, Chicago. Flip like the Script. Eight writer's battle basically so essentially the yeah. way that it was designed was to bring in writers who had directing aspirations so it was a production company uh who brought in a group of it was start out as a hundred personnel that we all submitted a video and a sample of our writing said here's the concept here's what i'm trying to do they cut that 100 down to 12 people and i made the top 12 so they said hey, man, we want you to travel to Chicago and be a part of this operation. I showed up there at a place called Color Reserve, which is one of the coolest internal Chicago 
like artistic community areas I've ever seen in my life. It's a multifunctional building that is all artistically based. They've got an entire wall of Michael Jordan Wheaties boxes cut in the shape of a shoe. Like it, it's very inspirational when you walk in the place. It's super cool. But, uh, but you show up there and the night you show up, they say, welcome to Flip the Script, Facebook Live event. Here's what's happening. We're going to give you a theme tonight. You're going to have six hours to write your initial prompt. We want to know your synopsis. We want to have a working understanding of what the story concept and characters are. We need you to give us some aspect of like, why would we care about following this story long term? So immediately they gave us the prompt Opportunity Knocks that very first night. Uh, with Opportunity Knocks, I immediately went, you know what would be really cool? Because I know everyone, just based on 2020, the drama and the craziness going on there, everyone in that community is going very dark, very uh, politically driven, very racially motivated. I knew those things were coming. So I wanted to set myself apart. Yeah. I wrote a story called Chapter and Hearst, The Misadventures of the Mob's Most Mediocre Assassin. And it was literally a... Uh, dark comedy about the worst assassin to ever work for the mob. I wrote that, got some feedback notes, made it through a few rounds, eventually won best screenplay with that, and then was given the opportunity to direct a five-minute short uh, for my story that I put together, uh, never directed before, so there was a steep learning curve. So, yeah, that's that's it. It. Ah, look, there it is. <laughs> Doing the research, I love it. <laughs> cool. No, it, yeah. looks, it, lo it looks awesome. Hey, I appreciate that, brother. It was. Uh, I'll was tell hilarious. you, I, I, I got some. Uh, I definitely got some learning, uh, some some lessons learned on set. But uh, I feel pretty confident and comfortable in my writing capability. It's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Uh, this uh, directing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought it was a guy sitting in a chair with a megaphone just kind of going, no, I'm cool. <laughs> like, well, like Alfred Hitchcock, you just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Louder, faster. Louder, faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not that at uh, all. It is more involved, like, I would assume. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a really cool experience, though. And uh, we put that bad boy together. Uh, I didn't win the overall competition, but I did win Best Screenplay as a secondary award. That was one of two awards that we as Battleborn Comics won last year. We also cheated. hit the uh, we also hit up the Blast Off Season Four competition uh, out of Los Angeles, California, and we won the Best First Five settings. You're all over our website. I love you. <laughs> We're, we're just in here getting, hitting it. You just go through. You you go through it for it. It looks, yeah, I love it. It looks great. <clears throat> I appreciate that, Have man. No Fury, and this is the new one? Is that, is that right? So, yeah, Have No Fury is our feature title for uh, Battleborn Comics. It's a story that I've been working on for years and years and years. Um, it's a 27-issue series cut into what we call nine books. Three issues makes up a book. The nine books are the nine circles of hell from Dante's Inferno. Oh, oh, nice. so, uh, yeah, very themed, very uh, religious suspense is the area that I would say we put it in. I like that. I like that. I had been searching and searching and searching. I mean, I'm a 36-year-old dude, 12 years in the Army. I've been searching for somebody that could bring this to life from an animation perspective, from a character development and design perspective. And I have yet to find an artist that can touch Robin as it pertains to really bringing what I put on paper into like into a world where I feel like uh, the things that I'm trying to communicate uh, make people feel something. And uh, th th this guy is, uh, I, he's not going to tell you because he's wearing the hat and he's in uh, incognito <laughs> right now. But uh, uh, I mean, you can't, you, you, say, he's a talented character. Rarely in life can you do it alone. You have to you have to rely on collaboration, and it's always good to find someone. Robin, I want to hear about I want to hear about the artwork. It's beautiful. Yeah. So um, the covers are actually not me. They're a, they're a another talented artist, a uh, friend of Chad's, who's a tattoo artist. Yep. Adam, um, Adam Del Rey. Yep. 
and uh, he he did great jobs with the covers. They're very um, yeah, they look great. Just uh, I I just love the flow of them. Um, but yeah, I've I've been uh, I've been basically drawing since I was four. Justin can probably tell you I, I used to draw all over my desk and get in trouble with them uh, with the teachers. But uh, I think you were the first person I saw draw that stupid skater s in like second grade. <laughs> <laughs> you know yes. Yeah, I'm pretty no, sure. No, uh, you always start out with the Van Halen, like the V8, you know, like that's how it start off. You build yeah. from there. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, so it was it was very serendipitous how Chad and I, I mean, we'd met before. We were, we were army buddies. So this is all my my art mm -hmm. right here um and it was it was just very um cosmos align kind of thing um so uh i i took a new position in the army and chad had just gotten out of the army and um the whole reason i got into the army was to go to art school it never happened mm. because they kept sending me to uh different countries um and i was just like you know what screw it i'm not going to go to college i'm just going to do this army thing till i retire that was and uh got you. My, my <laughs> wife had uh motivated me to start drawing again and to do something with my art and uh it it just so happened coincided with uh me getting this new job and my uh my boss was like hey because I told him, you know, my, I got into the army to pay for art school and just worked out. And he was like, hey, do you know Chad Ayunde? And I was like, yeah, I've known Chad for years. He was like, yeah, he's he's trying to start some sort of comic book stuff. And so when um, I called Chad, I was under the impression he was also an artist. And uh, so I talked to him and he was like, yeah, I've got this script and my artist just bailed on me so I'm thinking about giving it up and I was like well dude I'm an artist and then uh oh hell yeah that's how, that's yeah. how it happened it's like hey yeah, that's, I, that's, I, how, <laughs> that's how we, we got together and then we um so I started drawing um some of the scenes and everything and we started uh kind of kind of talking I, and he was in Maryland at the time and I came out there for a couple days um, every quarter or so and uh, we just started talking because we were thinking about like maybe selling it to image or looking at some other independent um, options and then we just kind of went well why don't we start our own Marvel and DC are kind of a wreck right now with all their uh, you know they want to force all this diversity and it's not working out for their bottom line because people are like well where's my favorite characters mm -hmm. um, I don't mind so much but uh and I guess that's how the whole comics gate got started but uh we were just like let's let's just do our own thing and see how it happens and then uh, we've been we've been rocking that for over a year now and it's it's actually come along pretty great we've got uh three titles for Hath No Fury. Um, I'm going to put those up again. Yeah. And then uh, Supar, which is um, a youth book. Uh, it's more for, you know, your preteens. Um, kind of a diary of a wimpy kid-esque story, but it's amazing. Supar. Um, yep. Uh, it's uh, like uh, diary of a wimpy kid meets Megamind. And uh, then you've got Progeny, which is the story that um, I kind of came up with and Chad helped me bring to life. And then we have Viper, which is our um, G.I. Joe ripoff. <laughs> because G.I. Joe I like that. <laughs> save his life. Um, and then uh, a couple, like Chapter and Hearse, um, but we haven't started, so I'm I'm actually currently drawing on Progeny. Um, we've opted for a, a different artist for um, Subpar, and then uh, we had a, another artist for Viper. He started with the concept sketches, and then like with most artists, he completely ghosted us. 
<laughs> oh man, from himself. Yeah, for say, Tom, how how rare is that you see a writer reaching out to artists for stuff like that? It seem doesn't seem like they, they're separate worlds to me. Well, it's uh, you know, it's an interesting thing in that it's always sort of like a weird. It it can be almost like a power exchange because usually a writer comes with you if if you're an artist with the script that they sort of already really kind of at least have like the first issue like kind of done and they're really coming at you going like i need someone to draw this i saw your stuff i think your stuff will fit for this like what do you think do you have the time can you fit it in your schedule you know and stuff like that and in that scenario, you're kind of like the pretty girl at the dance when, when you're the artist because you're getting attention. Now, it quickly flips because if you're someone who just really is all about the drawing and doesn't even, like, is like, I'm not a writer, I don't want to write, I don't want to create, I just want to draw, which a lot of artists are, then they are really sort of like always on the hunt to try to find um, a writer whose writing matches like what they want to draw. Mm. Um, like, uh, like, you know, like in my case, I've done stuff with different writers, but uh, I never really found anybody that exactly, uh, you know, meshed uh, well with my like sort of default tendencies. But that can be beautiful but, sometimes, right? I mean, oh like, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it totally is because it can get you to come out of like a comfort zone. Yeah. Comfort zone. I know yeah. as an artist myself, that's exactly I mean, those those collaborative processes are the ones but that the, help that's me to grow. the magic word though. Everyone uses collaborative and a lot of times it's listen, monkey, you draw what I oh, wrote yeah. you and you don't deviate and you don't change a panel. Yeah. And that's great. And by the way, I've got 40 gallons of dialogue in this tiny little square. And if you don't draw the Sistine Chapel in it, well, then I'm angry at you. And it's like, because I've worked with a lot of really great professional people, or mm -hmm. at least people who conduct themselves in a very professional manner. And then I've worked with the entire opposite of that. Yeah. I had one guy, he wrote a double page spread that didn't fall on a double page break. Like, huh. So when you open up a comic, a double page spread folds out like this, one page here, the other page here, right? Yeah. yeah. But if when you're writing it and you don't quite understand that like, you know, you open up a book, this is always your first page, the, the, the left-hand side here, right? So it's like inside front cover, you know, front page, then it's like page two, three, four, like that, right? If you don't keep that in mind, you're like double page spread, but really it's like, oh, it starts here and then it ends up on the There we back. go. Yeah. You're like, Good chat up here. Ah, you know, and it's hard to explain to someone that they made yeah. a pizza upside down because that's kind of what he <laughs> did in the script. And it's. I think so, I found. Yeah. Uh, I found your just, site. There we go. Just, is this oh, yeah. You? This is you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, my page. Oh. Show his newest uh, uh, stuff. Yeah, if you go to like. Do uh, I, Justin? Yeah, you could go to like gallery or like feature gallery. Either of, that, either of those are fine. And there's like a whole bunch of stuff you'll see, various drawings. A lot of the, uh, like, I did. Uh, oh, I like this one. I like this splash. Did, like Mortal Kombat. And, yeah, there's the He Man one I have there. Which yeah. one? Where is it? The Little. Battle Cat one, the red yeah. one. Uh, I obviously pointing at my screen like you can fucking see yeah. it. That's <laughs> it's, uh, right under like the Joker next to Lady Spawn. That, that's it's, okay. Uh, just like that, a ninja. Uh, I, I, I'm just taking it all in right now. I mean, this is a lot. I love this flash. This is that one. Yeah, right there. Um, your your uh, your two Deadpool pistols that you have there. It's almost center of the screen right now for us on the <laughs> share. Yeah, yeah. This, this one is very special to me for this reason. I'm gonna. I hope you guys won't be angry at me, but I'm gonna take two seconds to drop my uh, Batman set back here. And what? Oh no! Nice. Yeah. These are two Kimber. This is a 45 and a nine mil that my 
friends put together for me and my wife nice. uh, for my birthday. 36 years old on December 31st. Cool. We've got the uh, Wayne Tech uh, actual <laughs> customized logo work. <laughs> Uh, and my buddy completely customized these bad boys yeah, nice. uh, for me underneath the Batman symbol. So it's super, super yeah. awesome. That yeah, is cool. really cool. That's that's cool. I immediately went, oh my gosh, this is my world. The Deadpool piece this one, this one. is the most stolen from my site. It is the most stolen piece of artwork. How do they steal it? Are they just downloading it, or they rip it off the internet? I I had to go at every teacher company in existence for the past ten years. Oh <laughs> man! Because I did that in like two two thousand nine or something like that. Yeah, that sucks. That's just not fair. That's I uh, yeah. Well, I don't even so. care anymore. It's just, it's funny because it's like someone discovering I love Lucy for the first time and like stealing it. Like, at this point, I'm like, dude, it's already been stolen. You're you're so late to the party. Like, yeah. Like, like, yeah I've loved Deadpool forever. Um, I've literally I, gotten up in the middle, like in the morning with people texting me like, I think they're stealing your stuff, Tom. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like a, it's a Wednesday. Nothing new. <laughs> All the days that end with why my stuff gets stolen. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, hey, you Chad. Know, funny, like a character like Deadpool or Batman, they're super popular, and like everybody, every like shifty person on the internet will like grab a screen grab and then plaster it on a T-shirt and then make like. You know, five hundred or a thousand dollars. This is a big the, problem with Etsy right now. And, oh, it's on it, Etsy. It, it, it has been since uh, they went public. It's it's like t shirt companies like Rip Tees and and uh, uh, like any like sort of turnkey sort of um, yep. like remote type of place where it's like, oh, just upload your design and then you can put it on like merch. Yeah. The problem is, is a, a lot of the stuff comes from overseas, so it's not domestic United States where you can go after them legally. It's like they're over in like Singapore or China or wherever. So it's so much harder to police people out of the country. And so you're just like, if you're lucky, you can get them to pull it from the site. You, you're, you know, mm -hmm. but again, like that's at least like whole property that like DC owns, I don't own it or, or Marvel yeah. owns. I like, so it's like, well, yeah, I made the thing, I'm the creator, but you know, it's it's a cool drawing of Deadpool. I, I don't own Deadpool. I mean, hell, Rob Liefeld doesn't own Deadpool. So no. that that's such know. a that's a, such a weird aspect of this too. I think as it as it kind of pertains to intellectual property, and this is something that has been a pretty common conversation with Robin and I as it pertains to when you create something. Who owns it? How does it roll? What What's the monetary gain of said intellectual property uh, from a copywriting perspective? Oh, yeah. If someone takes the character, draws it exactly the same, and then names it something else, how do like how do you how do you target against like, that? You know like what? I, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a very challenging situation. I mean, Rob Liefeld literally walked into Image and drew Marvel characters with different names mm -hmm. and 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 was able to just walk away like, ah, it is what it is. You well, know? I mean, like, he did that for Marvel, never too. Dead, Deadpool. <laughs> De yeah. Deadpool was a direct ripoff of, like, Deathstroke. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and, and Marvel and DC do it all the time where they don't, it, it's not even really, they care anymore. It's who can make that character more popular. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's just funny. I mean, I'm. I definitely know with you guys, uh, like myself, like because you guys are creators, the the thought process is always like you're generating your own intellectual property, but then you're like you you got to figure like how do I protect it, but also I've got to make sure it really is its own. Uh, at least different enough thing that you can like trademark it or copyright it or whatever. You know, I, Tom, Tom, you're, you're, you're right on the money with that, brother. I, I spend so much time as we kind of craft some of the characters that we put together, some of the universes we're trying to design and some of the uh, ideas for overall 
uh, story kind of profiling, we're always looking for a way to differentiate ourselves from the market because at the end of the day, it's so easy for somebody to take three quarters of what you're doing and call it their own. Uh, we we oh, try yeah. to register everything that we have with Library of Congress, oh, yeah. and I have been, uh, so we started this in 2020, obviously. It's like $45 a pop or something, isn't it, to like register? Is, it's like $45 a pop to register at Library of Congress? Or that's can you right. Group, it's a, yeah, group it. that's, that's exactly right. That's about yeah. what we're pulling out of pocket every time we drop something. Um, and, and it's really interesting the way the Library of Congress does stuff, because what they will do is they will run an entire series for you. But if you don't have the entire series from the beginning, like I, I take Half No Fury as an example. Yeah. Half No Fury is a 27 issue, fully encompassed series that we are designing and developing. Mm -hmm. In order for us to hit all 27 issues, uh, to copyright Half No Fury in its entirety, we would literally have to have the entire product done, all art done, all, all writing done, yeah. everything ready and prepared in a package for them to say we copyright Half No Fury as one holistic entity. What we are running into right now is we have three issues that have been drawn of the 27 issues associated. Mm -hmm. So we have literally copyrighted three issues of a 27 issue series. If somebody picked up at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and decided they wanted Who to would know, them, yeah, we except have for you. to protect ourselves against yeah. uh, what that would look like in court. So it and is I, a, it's a very interesting conversation. I have to say that's really, really hard for a lot of artists to grasp too, is understanding how to hold their own property in hand. Absolutely. And I know I've struggled with that in the past, but, you know, it's an interesting point. I want to go back to something uh, both you guys, Chad and Tom, were mentioning earlier, and Robin, about, uh, like, how do you know you've gone through the process enough to create something new or fresh or original? And, you know, I had a mentor one time as a young composition student that told me, because I asked him a very similar question, you know, because I love Stravinsky, you know, that composer, <laughs> you know. And I was like, I don't want to sound like Stravinsky, but I tend to write music that sort of sounds like him. So, and he told me, as long as you honestly go through that process, if you engage with the process, with your whole being, you're going to come out in the end with something that is uniquely you. Authentically you. It's going to be authentic. You know, yeah, you're going to be a product of your inspirations and that's never going to fail. But as long as you engage with the process, then you're good, you know. Brian, I, I, I love what you're saying, and I hope I'm not stepping on anybody else, Tom or Robin or, or uh, Chumley Brother. If you guys want to jump in, please stomp on me. Uh, but, but what you're saying, Ryan, is something that's incredibly exciting to me because I, I think that you're, you're right on the money as it pertains to, for, for my process at least, um, the framework, concept, and idea of Half No Fury is something that I've been working on for 20 years. I started it, it when I was 16 years old. However, that framework and philosophy was heavily inspired by the work of Neil Gaiman. I have been a Neil Gaiman fan since yeah. I was a baby, baby, baby. And <laughs> as long as that dude's been around, I have been reading the works of what he puts out on paper. The Sandman series, American Gods, is really the heavy one that plugged me into uh, creating Half No Fury the, in the format that it comes in. And so there will always be some aspects and remnants of the crews that you are inspired by. For sure. But uh, if at the heart of your story, you are, and that's the that same thing for music, same thing for anything yeah, for, you're doing for, from a creative perspective, yeah. Drawing um, and painting, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. I believe if the heart of it is you and then the window dressing is inspiration and influence from somebody else, I think that you're always going to find something that may be a close comparison to what you're dealing with. Yep. Um, and in some cases, like, will be very happy, like, exciting for people as a bridge to other areas. Mm -hmm. um, if you focus directly on that thing when you're creating, it kind of changes that dynamic a little bit. I, I, I like think you could be an artist as a bridge. Art, yeah. Artistry is a bridge to uh, a new understanding. Yeah, Love. here's what I think happens on the other side that I think is interesting. Um, I'm in the legal field, so I, I see mm -hmm. this, I view things a lot of times. But man, the uh, 
litigation of destroying somebody into the zero confidence of not thinking something was their own. Woo. <laughs> That's got to be uh, empowering a little bit. You're just crushing somebody who created something like convincing them that it's not even not even original enough to be their own in a, in a court. Hmm. Oh, Gaslighting on a whole new level. Well, I mean, that's a that's one perspective, and there are people out there who, who sort of do that, but I think what's more common is two parties who factually 100% believe that they actually did create something that's the same. Like... Action. I mean, like, you know, like, you can meet people and be like, oh, I have a character who's like this mass vigilante. Oh, I have a character who's a mass vigilante. Well, we're all kind of doing Batman. So because there's a, a like, you know, it's the hero with a thousand faces, right? Like, there's, you know, you, you sort of plug in the hero's journey and it all sort of like, oh, and Luke is exactly like so-and-so who's exactly like so-and-so. Yeah. And then, he has a mysterious friend who does you know, so... See, I'm picturing the copyright attorneys and Marvel who are just fucking slaughtering, you know, independent artists. Well, I mean, like, but... Oh, yeah. Like, just it, beheading their... Yeah, but I mean, that's the, that's the game of whoever has the most money wins in court, right? Like, that's that game, right? Yeah, man. But, but dude, even, it's, it's even, then, they, they, even then, they can lose because they make weird things like... At one point, Marvel, all it had to do was pay $1 a year and they could keep the Conan license. But they just, because of a paperwork error, they just forgot to do it. And then they lost that license for Conan Comics for a long time. For, wow. you know, they, at least they, paid pennies, paid pennies for Superman, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I mean, artist or a writer. You can look at things wow. like, um, you can look at like Commandy, which is just like Planet of the Apes, right? Like when you look at that book and you're like, oh, that's a, you know, you look when it came out and you're like, yeah, I get it. And then you look at something like Adventure Time and then you look at Commandy and you're like, oh, they're very similar. Like there's a lot <laughs> of shit that he's just picking up from here and putting back down, you know? So well, here's hey, the everything option. sort of comes from something and we all, we all have influences which is yeah. which makes it hard that's what makes independent like creating your own stuff so difficult because we're all you know we've all got the same ingredients as how we're putting them together to make like a really good spaghetti sauce but you know it's like it's still spaghetti sauce so, you know, Tom, Tom you're on the money brother I'm a, I'm a Nicktoons yeah. kid I grew yeah. up at the end, right? And you you look at Doug and Rugrats and Hot Real Monsters and all these different Nicktoons from that time frame. They oh. follow the exact same recipe as it pertains to the content that they are designing and developing. They just interchange characters, interchange a little bit of storyline. But when you really look at the framework and model from episode to episode, those guys run off the same gasoline. They're no boss so, world. What's yeah. that? They're definitely not Bobby's world. You know what I mean? That that yeah. <laughs> that's right. Bobby's world is all I, other I, area. That's I remember that. Love. I love me some Bobby boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, as a kid, you know me growing up, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little older. I'm uh, you know I'm 48. So I I would grow up with like Thundar the Barbarian and Space Ghost and oh uh, Space Ghost, yeah, Space Ghost, yeah, Space and, Ghost, yes. and all that stuff. And I mean, my God, Hanna Barbera like made a format like a formula of just doing space ghost in different ways whether it's ator or blue falcon or like right. there's like five different exactly the same dude like like With different color <laughs> costumes yeah right. like oh you know, they the exact ator same stuff just, it's all space yeah. ghosts in different uniforms i mean <laughs> and in some ways like you look at like he-man right Every He-Man character is just muscular dude with a gimmick. Like, oh, I'm Beast Man. I'm really hairy. I'm Merman. I'm underwater. I'm Trapjaw. I'm a moron. You know, it's like that. It's like it was so much simpler back then. <laughs> it was. Gotcha. It was. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really fun when you watch things like the Toys That Made Us, and you see like how when they really were like making or designing some of this stuff. 
Yeah. It was really fly by night. Like Snake Eyes was an afterthought in GI Joe. He was That's like, right. "Oh, we got we got to round out the set. And we got one black, all black, you know, character. Boom, That's right. whatever. We'll make him a ninja." Okay. I it is that way because they had like one mold size, yeah, and just had to run with that. So yeah. everybody's the same size, portions, just different color schemes. Like just plug them into the plug them into the network. Right. Yeah, or like you see, like you know, with like Transformers, it was a bunch of different Japanese toys, a couple of different toy lines. They sort of like combined into one, and then sort of homogenized into this thing. And you're like, wow, you'd love to think there's a master plan off these like intellectual property that makes like millions and billions of dollars. Right. And it's like no, not so much. And then yeah. you can just like try to figure out why Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle works. That should not work. That should not work. Yeah. It shouldn't, but I did go see both movies, one and two, like 10 times in the theaters. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly worked on me. Brian, you were, you were my people, going, my like, Multi-generational. Like, when you saw the Vanilla Ice movies... Oh, come on. Like I danced to Ice Ice Baby. Like, now kids today, they don't know those movies. They know whatever a cartoon version is out right now. It's so For sure. Amazing world of gumball. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not quick, quick not question for the group. Did you so do you guys as a whole, has has everyone on this call in some capacity, they've watched G.I. Joe, they have some understanding oh, yeah. of the characters, the design, the kind of framework. So uh much like I don't know if you guys are familiar with Adi Shankar, who is an old uh, director who kind of took over the bootleg universe, he stole a bunch of Marvel, DC, and kind of Hanna-Barbera properties and started making YouTube kind of rogue videos of him doing movies with his famous friends in Hollywood. Uh, mm -hmm. Got sued a couple of times, but now he is the head of the Castlevania uh, animated series on Netflix, and he also... Yeah. Uh, is going to be heading up the Assassin's Creed project that's going to be launching to Netflix in time. Adi Shankar is somebody who is a heavy influence and inspiration for the work that I do. Um, obviously, I'm not him. I'm not nearly as talented as him. But something that I do think about, oh, he would, <laughs> this man is ready for all things. I love it. Not so, all the time. Uh, so no. Adi Shankar is a guy who... Uh, you slip onto YouTube at any point in time, you type his name in, you're going to find some really cool things. Dread was a big project of his, uh, which was that like th that new age version of Judge Dread, the remake. Um, but the one of the things he's very famous for, uh, as it pertains to his time with, uh, as it universe. pertains to his time with, uh, with the YouTube universe, was a Power Rangers. Yep, uh, there it is. movie he created is on there yep his, yeah his, so his, yeah so his power rangers video was literally him going what were what would happen if all the because he's like when i was a kid power rangers was serious to me to a lot of people it was a joke it was silly it was goofy and people thought it was like corny karate he said to me Power Rangers was serious. These are child soldiers yeah. being launched into this universe it's the where they're responsible for fighting for the freedom of people. He said, soldiers come back with PTSD. He created this dark Power Rangers universe, which was associated with, uh, he's friends with James Vanderbeek, and James Vanderbeek was his lead for yeah. the Red Ranger, who was like suffering from PTSD, was kind of batshit crazy. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss. Am I allowed to cuss? You absolutely are. Awesome. So he's kind of batshit crazy, uh, James Vanderbeek, and he literally was like, uh, fucking Dawson's Creek. Is that who we're talking about? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> he made him this, <laughs> this, this PTSD <laughs> Skepto Red Ranger, right? And he's like, when I was 16, I was like karate kicking motherfuckers in the head. And then we came to this point where literally, you know, like I, I killed all these people. I did all this crazy stuff, aliens, whatever. Um, I was very interested in that. So as we, Robin and I both began to craft the framework and design, I mean, this is a long story to tell you that the uh, Viper Squadron, the Voluntary Inter uh, Intervention Peer Response Program, 
uh, that we designed for our GI Joe ripoff is literally taking all the silly blue and red lasers where no one ever actually gets shot and turning it into something very visceral and real. We are literally dealing with a package of personnel who suffer from PTSD. They have joined an, a peer intervention group where they can work together, but what they don't realize is the lead of that group is a CIA operative who is very well versed in the concepts of Project Mockingbird and is brainwashing the individuals who step into that position uh, to become really agents to go work on the government's behalf in these dark operations. Wow. Paul, what were you saying there, man? What's that? I was actually just going to ask, have you, I'm not sure, I'd have to double check this. Have you guys ever seen the old TV show, well, old TV show, old animated show, Mask, M-A-S-K? I have it's, it. it's essentially kind of Knight Rider meets G.I. Joe. I want to say the bad guys were Viper, too. I okay. not what it was. Uh, I'd have oh. to look it up. It's really I funny. remember that name. Oh, no, the, oh, the bad guys I were called... I eyeball that, too, myself. Yeah, they were called Venom, my mistake. Venom. I knew it was a V. Yeah. All good. <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, Mask is basically a G.I. Joe ripoff, but yeah. it's uh, with cars. So it's very, like, Knight Rider meets G.I. Joe, yeah. Uh, they, also, they, do wear, they, they do wear masks. They actually do do that. Like, it's a... You can YouTube, like, YouTube mask cartoon theme, and you'll like you'll get like the whole effect. Of, like it lasted like a season. It's just ridiculous. But. Uh, so, so when we get off this call, if possible, at some point tonight, I need everyone's contact information. If you guys are eighties, nineties ish yeah. fans of cartoons, there is literally a website that is specific yeah. to the 90s main... cartoon stuff that I watch on a regular basis. They've got biker mice from Mars. They got toxic crusaders. They got oh, yeah. Here Here go. Go. they got all the like 90s. The Battle shows. <laughs> I'm 100% open to I share. Mean, I, think share, it's, share uh, well. I think it's like it has the, the main guy. I think he drove like a, a DeLorean that had like the gull wing. Uh, type of uh, doors. I forget. Yeah. Um, this is crap. I <laughs> no, I'm watching it right now. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I don't know. It's, it, yeah, so, yeah, oh, wait. No, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Hold on. Yeah, I got it. I got it. No, I don't know. This is probably not an avenue worth pursuing, but I, I'm really curious, Tom, by because I love hearing about these old shows that I forgot about. <laughs> Kid. I've never had cable, so it's just like I was super limited. You know what I mean? I feel there it is. I yeah, there it's, it is. It's definitely Transformers. There it is. Oh, yeah. he's got the he's got the suicide doors. Yeah, and it goes on and on. But got, guys, also got to check out Pirates of Dark Water. If that's not one that you have watched in time, that was a nineties uh, a nineties specialty. Pirates of Dark Water was big time. Gargoyles. Oh, yeah. Gar oh, Garga, you know gargoyles is I got t-shirts yeah. in my bedroom of gargoyles. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was a Dungeons and Dragons fan, dude. Like I still am a big nerd, fantasy nerd. Yeah. Come on a minute. Like, you know how you mentioned you your uh writer that you followed up? R.A. Salvatore is like uh you know, D and D Forgotten Realms author that you know he's like a 40 book series now that I've, I've literally <laughs> read. You know, I'm excited when the next one comes out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It made me all misty eyed and shit. <laughs> it's, it's just basically Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? It's just like an Elves and Dwarves and shit. It gets me where I need to be. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Perspective. Well, we got to keep this world running forward with uh, some of the yeah, animated that's stuff fine. and some of yeah. our books and whatnot. And that's the nature <laughs> of art. Get you Dude, where you need to be. I don't know what happened yeah. to Tom, but that uh, he's back. He's back. His foot, mm. foot fist Frankenstein. I think we need to look at that. It's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look that up. The artwork in there looked really good. What is that one? It's it's his latest Tom. I was trying to describe that. Pull it up for me, will you? I am. I can throw the link in the chat if that helps. Now, Tom, uh, you you did a Kickstarter for this book, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a Kickstarter. Uh, I launched it in July and it ended in August. 
In fact, because I would love to know how that process goes. Because Chad and I are looking at doing a Kickstarter for for one of our books, and as far as the process and and everything that kind of goes into it, we kind of have a a foothold in in it. But I know there's a lot of uh, different um, like funding sites like Kickstarter. Um, well, the okay, so yeah. So the reason people tend to like Kickstarter over, say, Indiegogo or GoFundMe and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, basically is because uh, Kickstarter has been around for a while. So people, especially in the comic book world, know it. Like fans really do know the site. And also they're already members, so they don't really have to like um, sign up specifically. A lot of them already have back so many other creator campaigns that they're just part of that area. So it's basically pledging is only one click away. Uh, the big advantage if you are someone who backs a campaign is that if the campaign doesn't reach its goal, like for whatever reason, then you don't get charged. You're not out the money. Whereas like Indiegogo and other stuff like that, it's more like you donate if they don't make their goal, well, you still gave them that money. So okay. there can be kind of like a feel badsy sort of scenario yeah. there. So that's so, what makes it sort of a little more popular for creators to go say Kickstarter as opposed to the other options that are out there. Okay. Uh, Tom, is this your, is this your Kickstarter is involved? Like, Kickstarter. like it's a. Uh, it's a, it's a process that um, takes up a lot of your time. And uh, you really want to do, like, I did a lot of prep work before I launched my Kickstarter. Like, I interviewed about six other artists. I, I made myself, like, a, a master questions list of about 100 questions of, like, everything I could possibly think of to ask for uh, you know, having a campaign, like, you know, how many goals did you set? What were your goals? What were your stretch goals? Did you like this? Did you like that? Um, you know, was your book hardcover? Was your book softcover? How many pages did you do? Uh, what, what got you the best response? Like, what was the threshold at work? You know, I really had, yeah, like a hundred. And I interviewed four to five different uh, artists I knew who had done Kickstarters, uh, in some cases, people who had done more than one. And I really very much like picked their brain of like, I went through the list and then once I had all of them, I sort of collated and figured out like, what were the commonalities? Like, what did they all say were going to be problems and what were things were going to be like, oh no, you want to do it this way instead of that way. Like, um, like one of them was like international shipping, right? And you have the option to always either do domestic shipping or internet and or international. The pitfall with international is when you ship in the United States, the continent of the United States, if you do a graphic novel, uh, like a book, you know, like this, there that's over 60 pages, you can send it media mail through the United States post office. So sending this book all packaged up only costs like $4 in shipping, right? Wait, for international? Internationally, it's yeah, no, international though, that can yeah. be like triple. Like, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Quadruple. You know, right? I, I have some experience with this. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. That's why a lot of sellers that sell within the United States do not, they choose not to ship international because it's just too much of a hassle. That, that's literally us right now. I mean, we, yeah. we are in that position where we are, if you go to our website, we are literally only shipping internally. And then I did take one shot to try and fire a comp copy to one of my cousins who lives in China right now because he's teaching English over there. And uh, it disappeared on us. Mm -hmm. So so obviously it was like, well, that's not worth the time. I'm wasting time. I'm wasting comics. So we're not doing it. 
So, uh, so the international shipping is absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's why when people do Kickstarters, you also will generate a digital component because people can back you, like anybody internationally, they can just back you and then just download the digital component after the campaign, you know, is over. So yeah. that way you're still reaching people and getting your book out there but you're just doing it in the most cost-effective, efficient way. Because I mean, hey, like, you know, if the link doesn't work, you can always send them another link to, to download, you know, the, the, the book or the file or whatever. Yeah. Tom, I'm, I'm and, gonna ask uh, you a weird, I'm gonna ask you a weird question because you have this experience. Cause literally we all, the whole month of January, or I'm sorry, November and December, we, Robin and I were working on a Kickstarter project for our next, uh, project that we hope to launch. I was, uh, I took a master class, got some experiences and went, oh man, I think I know what's going on. And we started like building out the plan, right? Because you think when you get any education that suddenly you're the subject matter expert. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What one thing that, uh, one thing that I would ask you is as it pertained to, and maybe this is too much, but you tell me if it is or if it isn't. Um, as it pertained to your purchasing uh, kind of demographic, did you find a higher percentage or lower percentage of international uh, interest in the project you were working on? For me, uh, I'm, I, I would say I found that well, I guess it's different. I immediately excluded international sales from the equation because uh, I knew I wouldn't ship there because it just absolutely. wouldn't work. So yeah, the vast majority of people that backed me were, um, you know, in North America, were domestic here in the United States. Absolutely. Uh, that being said, I did. I I am on message board communities and fan communities where there were people internationally who did get the digital version. But it still was very like a very like 80 20 ratio of, of that of like 80 people in the continent in the United States and then like 20 from like wherever, you know. Um, but if, of if you have both, you'll get both, you know. It's certainly um, Good. let me sneak in a dumb question. I mean, also, my book is written in English. I don't have it translated. So if you don't speak English, like, I don't know why you like. You're, yeah, you're already out of the equation from that yeah, perspective. Like, so, you know, that aspect is there too, but. Nah. Absolutely. Ready for my dumb one? Sure. What? sure. When, is it all just digital art now? I mean, Robin, are you still putting pencil to paper? Is anybody uh, doing that? Yes and no. So most of my stuff, so like to, it, it's weird. So digital art is absolutely um, 100% easier. Like it, it, it was a huge learning curve for me. Um, but once you get the hang of it and you're like, okay, this works, um, it's 100% easier because you can just hit the back button. Um, but there's still a, for challenging myself. So Chad um, has a, a few different writing styles um, as far as the story he's telling. So he, he will totally immerse you in a world. And I've tried to adapt my art to fit that. And I think I've done it pretty well because my art from the start of the project to my art for the finished project are totally different. Um, and uh, so in, in doing that, I literally just draw. I'm like, this works, this doesn't. And it, that's putting pen to paper. Um, and then I, I transfer all that over to, uh, to the digital platform, finish it all out. And then we shoot it off for, for coloring because that's really not my jam. I'm I'm not that good at it. So yet. it sounds it sounds like you really do have an affinity for the pencil and paper. I do. I that's Sorry. my preferred. I mean, I have to say I I do as well. I mean, I'm a composer, and so I have I when I write music, I write <laughs> with pencil and paper usually. But oftentimes, I do find myself working digitally, like through engraving programs and whatnot. 
because well, it is easier. You know, I think the, but, the what makes it easy is that um, if you work digitally, once you have stuff on the computer, it's easier to manipulate yeah. and also easier to share and move around. Like, like my printer for my book was in Canada mm. and I just, you know, you just send them the files, you just FDP the files right up to their server. And like, you know, they sent me templates back and, you know, all that stuff. And uh, you know, from that aspect to production aspect, it's it's streamlined and simpler. Uh, but really, a lot of artists still work very much like a hybrid. Like I know Scotty Young does like a 50-50. He'll like I think he'll like he'll draw and sketch up everything on on his computer. Then he'll print it off and then ink it up and finish it uh, that That's way. Interesting. Yeah. You know, um, other people are like the opposite. They might sketch first and then bring it into the computer and, and clean it up and, and bring it to completion that way. Like, I mean, you have to identify the process that works best for you. And, yeah, there's and no one. I, I don't look down on any process, no matter what it be, no matter what it might be. I know yeah. for me, it's pencil and paper. But what, yeah. what, I, what I think is so interesting about what you guys are saying is that there is there may be an assumption that this is just something that's authentic to the artist community, like mm -hmm. the artistic individuals. But I can tell you right now that uh, I've been writing a Batman story mm -hmm. since I was a kid. And I literally, mm -hmm. this is the world that wow. I have tried to immerse uh, the, the whole Batman concept, it's it's pencil, it's literally pencil, I erase things. Yeah. It's pencil and paper of pages and pages and pages of a Batman. There you go, Tom. Page. I've so got... Uh, this is the actual working script. This is my copy that I printed out to use for this book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, was actually, this is actually a Kickstarter oh. reward. I send this off to somebody in like a couple days. Yeah, put it up there. literally, it's just like came out of my printer and has every crappy typo that I will ever <laughs> make ever, and my insane notes to myself and Same. You know, yeah, me too. This, I mean, this is just a stack that I've worked on in like the past month, yeah, or uh, two months. You know, it's just like it. My house is full of paper. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it's not bad. You know, like the production side of things, it's not bad to do an analog because. Again, getting back to like, you know, doing a Kickstarter campaign, you want to create rewards. And mm -hmm. uh, as a visual artist, the easiest type of rewards I can create are stuff I draw. Authentic so it's like stuff original you. art pages. Yeah, that means something. Just... Stuff like that, right? But if you work predominantly digitally, you don't generate that physical product as much. So you don't have as much to then turn around and leverage as like a giveaway or to sell and things of like things of that nature. So it becomes a weird balance of like, how much do I want to generate purely analog? And then how much do I want to generate like, you know, hybrid digital for efficiency? Like you, you're fighting those two aspects. Do you find yeah, go Justin, go Justin. I'm sorry, but I just had this problem because Dave, the creator of our logo, he just switched from you know, hand physically creating things that I could put on my wall um, to now sh doing digital shit and I can't put it on my wall without a fucking middleman. I don't appreciate it. <laughs> you know? I actually well, think it, shit. it has a lot to do with uh, the age. So like... Uh, that was going to be my next question. So please go. Yeah, yeah. So like uh, my both my kids um, in school, they get laptops now. and They get like little, like my... Um, both of them know how to use an iPad better than I will ever know how to use. And my three-year-old knows how to use it. Better. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've I've got a one turns twelve tomorrow, and the other one turns five in a week. Mm. Um, and uh, they they are electronic based, and I, I mean that's how our community is with technology right now. And I mean, um, so I I think more and more because I know that at like Marvel and DC and for the full-time guys at Image, um, they're they're on a digital platform um, in order well, it, for it them to streamline with, that process. It actually does vary with those guys. Like 
many of them do use like Cintiqs and stuff like that, like yeah. th th that stuff. But um, <laughs> there is a weird secret about being a professional artist, and that is uh, you want to have your original pages up for collectors to resell. There's a certain amount of money in that. So um, about right. at least a quarter of those guys, even if they do almost fully digital, they will do some pages specifically analog just to sell. But could just that just be, be like, a holdover? Oh, I mean, I, I, I wonder if younger generations just um, do, well, do away with that process altogether, you know, and, and we will be exclusively digital. I mean, there's always going to well, be people out there like me who want a pencil and paper. Right now, right? I'm sorry, say it again, Tom. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, I was going to say, think of it like vinyl albums, right? Like music, right? I own a lot. Me growing up, I'm a kid of the 80s. It was cassette tapes. I didn't own albums because that wasn't what you had. Like, you wanted to put the cassette in your car and listen to it. You wanted to put it in the boom box, you know, say anything style and do all that. Like, <laughs> you know, that movie would be totally different if he held up a, a giant Victrola, like, you know. The needle so bouncing around. Now, yeah, like now it's very much like have a cool turntable, listen to vinyl, like experience that. That's because and, vinyl. And that's great. In my like opinion, is Generationally, it, it bounces. It bounces. It does balance, but in, in, in my opinion, I, I think like higher quality formats sort of come to the top, like oil on the top of water, maybe. And vinyl is a higher well, quality format. That's it. as an audiophile, that's my belief. But you know, <laughs> I mean, come on, a 180 gram record that hasn't been compressed. <laughs> Yeah. And and then when you scratch your needle one time because your kids are dancing and oh, you're yes. very angry, like I, I see your point. Like my girlfriend's a drummer, she's a musician, mm -hmm. and she totally schools me on like the sound quality is better. But mm -hmm. if you're going from like quality, Betamax should have won the battle, man. Like Betamax always had better quality than VHS, but VHS became dominant. And I mean, ultimately, now we're all streaming, so who cares? Yeah. yeah. But their trends and people mechanics don't make sense. Like, people like the thing that people really loved about CDs is that you didn't have to rewind them and they wouldn't get eaten in your car's tape deck or melt on your dash. So, this is example in point. This is my 16 millimeter copy of Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. It's awesome stuff. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, then you got to bust out your reel to reel and yeah. set it up, you know. It's a process, I love it. Like the AV nerd did in seventh grade when I was doing that stuff. And so what I'm saying is, is like, we talk about quality and other like technical specs that true um, uh, 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 crafts people care about. And that's important mm -hmm. to them the general everyday people do not know the difference. They do not care. Their ears aren't trained. Their eyes aren't trained. Good point. So for them, it's whatever's like, whatever's almost in vogue to, for them to be digestible. Like, I mean, like we talk about movies. People used to go to fucking drive-ins, man. Like I, I have a drive-in right down the street that I take my kids to. It's one of the yeah, last and ones you see the teenagers the having sex in the back somewhere because that's what I did when yeah. I <laughs> so I'm so I'm incredibly un interested in what you guys are talking about for this reason. Uh obviously is uh people who are new to the comic book production community, right? Robin and I have been buying comic books for years, but we are new to the create them and sell them. Uh, yes, it was world. a big learning do, process. Do you feel like that same, what you're saying right now, do you feel like that same sentiment rests in the comic book community? Because uh, my thought process is most of the people at this point in time, I, I did a pretty sick uh, research uh, evaluation for my um, for my bachelor's in integrated social sciences with Penn State, um, and literally I, I did a, a huge research program within the comic book community to try to get a gauge for like what people are into, how uh, impactful Comics Gate has been on the overall purchasing and buying power of the uh, demographic overall. Uh, obviously, 
as a guy in northern Alabama, I was kind of tied down to this area, but I, I did a ton of, of research, empirical research, to try and determine, you know, what makes the most sense as it pertains to the future of this industry. Do you, do you anybody on this call, feel like this idea that, hey, digital is better People like digital because they don't want to have to have things keep it like hanging out in their houses. Do you feel like that philosophy, concept, idea impacts our ability as comic book publishers, producers, designers uh, of selling uh, our wares uh, to, 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 a, to an industry? As a... I can weigh in on this. Yeah, brother. I'm, I'm open for anybody that's sitting on this bad boy. I'm just, I'm asking questions because this seems like a, uh, a group of intellectuals. I love questions. Uh, in a space I'm damn interested in. So. <laughs> Let's go. I see, this, yeah. uh, I see possessions as a luxury. I think, uh, and also a lack of possessions is also a luxury. Absolutely. Good. And I think that will be the only market that will exist for most things will be your your luxury top end just collect your you know just so they can say they own something physical Certainly. it's a it's you know everybody has their own thing they're into oh, for sure they want for sure. to hold and show off when somebody comes over Own it, owning so hard copies market becomes everything. status it's a status thing yeah yeah but the selection of what people are choosing like if for example i'm not i only got so much money to blow on bullshit i'm into so i'm gonna pick something i'm super fucking into if i'm gonna throw some cash at it absolutely mm -hmm. a lot of times i fucking you know realize i probably wasn't that into it afterwards yeah but that's that's the kind of the thought process of the consumer is find it i, I got find an extra 30 Check this. What can I blow this shit on? What looks cool? Oh, yeah. Let me check this motherfucker out. So that's what you're competing with is the scarcity of the purchasing power. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so. Well, when you get into purchasing power, though, there's, there's two forces of battle, right? Mm -hmm. There's the boutique style where you're like, I want something that's durable, that's going to last, that has a certain concrete um value right yeah but then there's also the ease of the delivery system right yep because you and i we, we you know we work hard for the money we value it we want to get these things yep. that we like that are precious to us mm -hmm. yep. but remember if you're like me you started buying comic books when you were a little kid with like pocket money that like you got from like mowing the lawn or pastoring your parents. It's been a love for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. And so you just would like, you'd go to like me, I would go to the drugstore, the newsstand, then the comic shop when they started to show up. And right. I would just buy the cool stuff that I liked. I sure there's always like, it's oh, number one, issue number one, issue zero. But, you know, ultimately, you're like, hey, that spawn looks really cool. Or, hey, Batman's fighting a swamp thing right. this week. That if looks it's less cool. people like, in person looking at things, the market for somebody, the local market extends itself because you don't have your brick and mortar access to a lot of shit anymore. So it opens a door for people like you guys that I, I'd really buy something at this point in my life for, from somebody I know who I can say created it because the, yeah. Oh, the absolutely. It's kind of swayed from the big market, you know, cut and paste shit and yeah. it's really shifted back to the creator. It's a creator's world currently. I, 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 I don't want to misdirect the conversation, but, but to your point, Justin, that I absolutely agree. It is imperative that each, of us as consumers in the society, no matter how much money we have to give in back to society, actually consume from people that we know. I mean, everything needs to be a grassroots movement. So if you want to buy a comic book, I think at this point to rebuild the economy, we got to buy from buy locally. I mean, I think that's really vital that we do so right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. 
Well, yeah, especially so I, I jump on the back end of that with two things. One, Ryan, I love you, and that <laughs> that, that uh, that's absolutely amazing. And I feel like though I have only met you on this call, we have become best friends throughout uh, this call. Uh, <laughs> Justin, brother, um, I would then follow that up with in the research that I did. Um, one of the things that was very interesting was that it seemed as though individuals who operated within the, what I would call comic book consumer community, had uh, probably like a 64 to 66 percent uh, interest in tactile um, uh, stuff. They wanted Book things they could touch and grab and look at and feel. They didn't want some PDF or Microsoft thing that I could print out whenever I want. They literally wanted the whole comic book concept and philosophy. It was like, I'm a comic book fan. I want the damn book in my hand. Mm -hmm. If I, if, why would I buy it on PDF? Well, it, but keep in mind that like that's also because they've conditioned for like 40 years that paper is the product they get, right? Like, yeah. I mean, my 12 year old or Our next generation children. doesn't care. They're going to read every book. Yeah. Like uh, every school book is going to be on their tablet, like yeah. their laptop. And uh, I mean, well, I mean, look at it, look at this. Like uh, the other day, I had to set something up. The owner's manuals don't come anymore with stuff you ship. You just go to YouTube and you look at their YouTube tutorial on how to set it up. Yeah. Yeah. Everything they, they the art of manual money. writing has gone by the wayside. Oh, but they don't want to spend <laughs> money Amazon, sending it to Amazon you. for everything. Yeah. But the truth is, there's also some awesome, great demos where people unlock and like, yeah, yeah, the manufacturer says to do this, but really, yeah. if you do this little hack, this will work Those way better problems. for your thing. You know, so you you do get information and resources quicker and, and faster. So I don't, th I think there's always going to be two things with comics. I think there's always going to be a boutique collector drive where people want a nice boutique, you know, hardback, you know, solid thing that they can own and put on their shelf and display and look at. And then I think there's going to be the original of Frankenstein. Yeah. And, but I also think like there's going to be. Um, a, a desire to just have like, hey, I just want to download some comics real quick because I'm taking a flight and it's going to be four mm -hmm. hours. And yep. uh, hey, they don't have to be good. They just have to keep me busy. Like <laughs> one of the things I use is I use the library app on my iPad. It's called Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A. And if you have a valid library card, like wherever you're at, um, you can just go on to the Hoopla app, H-O-O-P-L-A, and you put in your library card number and you can read comic books. You can also read novels, get audio books, children's books, a whole bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, they I, don't, and these aren't like comics from 1970, whatever. There's brand new stuff that just came out last week on these sites like on on your database tom is that stuff independent or is it uh marvel dc and the big guys oh it's everybody it's, everybody it's really spectrum. basically you just, yeah you just contact the um like library association of of the united states and and uh oh, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna look this up because i i think this is really important that you know because yeah it's a uh, great I, app i, I know we're big board. readers in my family because right it's free now. you yeah. get um for, it varies in your reading how many books you can check out at one time. Uh, for me, it's like six. So, yeah. Now, now Tom. You get the books for, I want to say you have them for 30 days before they revert back. Yeah. They, then they revert back. Yeah, like Ed Brubaker's Reckless. That's like, I think, an image book. Um, I mean, this is amazing, especially you know, as a father, as, as you guys are as well. I mean, that's just to have this at your finger. Like, I don't yeah. limit my kids screen time. <clears throat> really, I don't. But I do encourage them and sometimes demand that they use it responsibly, yeah. you know, for their own education. And that can be for whatever. My, my daughter is an artist. She's an aspiring, even at seven years old, she's an aspiring visual artist. She yeah. loves it. Uh, 
so but to have something like this at your fingertips would just be amazing yeah and it, like i said like it has audio books it has children's books mm -hmm. it has you know prose novels but it, like the comic book thing i had heard about a while back um i was at some show and somebody from the library association had told me about this app and i was like oh i'll check it out i got a library card here and uh it's pretty impressive yeah they have a, they have manga on it like it's all like i mean it's curated content you have to probably go through a bunch of stuff but they have current stuff like every every new wednesday when there's new stuff that drops it gets updated and okay. the library like you know things shift and now and from from an independent creator standpoint tom have you seen more sales in digital or actual boutique style like hard copy um that you mailing? know that i think goes back to the digital versus analog you know debate that we have comic book readers predominantly right now are analog readers so most of my sales and a lot of other friends of mine sales who are other uh, creators like these are guys who have books at image and books other indie books they put out themselves it's the physical book that's doing more uh sales than the digital would you say design. that perhaps there's been like double sale because I, I speaking from my own experience as far as like buying vinyl and albums like i've often bought the same album twice being yeah. you know i buy it digitally digitally first and then and am enamored with it and buy it on vinyl you know, oh, I mean, does that sure. the same thing happen in the comic book world? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I know just with myself, I've had that with, with my book. I've had, like, the people who pledged, some people pledged for the digital rewards, and then after the campaign was over, you know, they contacted me and like, hey, you know, I, I is there any way I can get the physical book too? Like, I decided I changed my mind, or hey, that looks really cool now that I see it physically as an object, like, yeah. You know, because you look at it on screen and you try to provide the best, most accurate pictures, but, you know, in real life... It's on the person's a, device, it depends on formatting. I mean, you have to make sure... Yeah. It does, I, I, I don't mean to cut anybody off, but I but I literally, this, this research study that I did here in Alabama, I can't speak to the entire state or nation, or the entire nation, but I can speak to northern to central Alabama. We were literally looking at somewhere between like 62, 63, 64, all the way upwards to 68% of 237 people that I talked to face to face saying, do you want a comic in your hand or do you want to order it offline and have a PDF file dropped in your email that you can eyeball? And it was 60 plus percent, almost 70 percent of those personnel who oh, were like, like that. I'm a comic fan. I want a fucking comic. <laughs> no, <but laughs> give me, you know, give me my stuff. Like, you're, you're talking to pizza lovers, though, asking them if they like pizza. Fair. If you, know, if you look at like pirate websites where people download stuff like yep. movies and music, there's a lot of comic book piracy. Like, there's uh, that's fair. But you but are those true fans, though. Literally, just no, said though, that they're, the they're not. They're not fans. Come from the same no. population, right? They're, those people are very casual fans, but they are downloading and, and looking at the product. So That's fair. it is a. And don't forget, like digital comics is brand new for all of us. They've only been around maybe the concept in actual like doability, like. It's the iPad that makes digital comics work. And yeah. the iPad's only been around for maybe, what, 20 years? 15 yeah. years? So I, this is a brand new concept that the kids, that you know, the 10-year-olds the today, when they're 45, <laughs> that's going to be the time that when, if you ask them that same question, well, do you want it physically or do you want it, you know, digitally, they're going to be like, both you know like Certainly. whatever's easier for them like they don't you know we grew up like me i i grew up like i got mine at the the drugstore off the spiral rack when i was a kid oh. mm -hmm. and and then i went to the comic shop where the guy yelled at you every day because he didn't want kids in his shop yeah 
And he also sold ninja weapons because it was 1980. Tom, I don't dispute your point in any way, shape, or form, brother. But what, what I will tell you, just based on my experiences, and yeah. this is just obviously just my situation, and yeah. it, it doesn't speak to the world. But what I can tell you is I talked to 15, 14, 13, 12, 11 year olds who had parents sign waivers to say, yeah, we're cool with it. And I'm telling you, based on my experience, that there is a higher percentage of people associated with the comic book industry yeah. that have an interest in tactile pieces yeah. of equipment. I, 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 I think it goes for all readers love, alike. If, if you're not in comics, What's you done? love ordering Twilight and whatever off of PDF files and looking at things. But the, there was a, a heavy percentage, like an overwhelming percentage of personnel that were like, I come to a comic shop, I do comic orders, I put my time into the comic book industry yeah. because I like to have something that I can show. Yeah. People. Oh, I've, no. seen, I've seen it with... Um, you go. I'm going to use it real quick. I, I, I agree 100%. But also, don't forget that people lie to themselves. The subject of an experiment should never know what the experiment's goal is Absolutely. because their knowledge will influence it. Mm -hmm. And that's the most like problematic thing when you're trying to get valid data and Absolutely. trying to sell to people. Because I've been at shows, I've been at shows, and people be like, No, man, I, I like, I buy comics, I buy this and that. And then they'll go past you and they'll go past me and they'll go past you and they'll go past you. And then they'll buy a Funko Pop. And you're like, you motherfucker, you lied to me. <laughs> you you lied. Comics. You don't want comics. You want your Simpsons <laughs> Funko <laughs> Pop. Like, your stupid you. toys. You. <laughs> but like, I, I would say that like, I think the tactile, like having it in hand and everything, um, it is probably going to stay kind of a mainstay because like if you take okay. an 11 year old into a comic book store it, it's like walking into a toy store yeah. like there's all the action figures everywhere and then all the cool art and they're like oh this is amazing and so they're going to become kind of that instant fan of having a comic book in hand mm -hmm. if they're going for a comic book mm -hmm. because like, i definitely think the key takeaway is that at least for the next hundred years it's both it's, yeah. it's going to be both like i think that, yeah in our lifetime it's going to be like a digital aspect and component and it's going to be the physical aspect and the component and if you're and if you're a creator or you're a publisher then that's awesome because then you do get that double dip effect you get the people who might try it out on digital if they like it and they become a fan they'll get it in physical and they might even go that next level and be like, oh, well, I got your, I got the nice Kickstarter version. But when you did that, like, deluxe that's, like, double thick and you really tricked it out even more, oh, I had to have that, too, you know. Because, I mean, look at, like, um, oh, man, look at, like, Mondo albums. Like, Mondo has, like, these amazing vinyl albums that are, like, pieces of art and sculpture. Mm -hmm. And they do limited runs and they're like, oh, like, check this stuff out. Like, it's, it's beautiful stuff. And they get people who already have the soundtrack for Rambo. Rambo. <laughs> like, that, that movie barely has a soundtrack that just has Stallone grunting. Well, what's That's there is good. pretty good. <laughs> no, well, you know. I mean, great. And, like, Goblin's awesome. And, like, some other stuff is really great. Like, the, like, like the like John Carpenter has done a soundtrack for like Escape from New York and he mm -hmm. composed all that stuff and it's oh yeah you know, great stuff it is great yeah. but it is interesting that like that is such a boutique thing that like in 1980 I could go into the Wall of Sound in the Viewmont Mall in Scranton Pennsylvania where I grew up and get that soundtrack for like eight dollars on a cassette. Mm -hmm that I would then play and melt on the dashboard of my F-150, because that's what happened to that, you know? So uh, we're never gonna get away from the boutique collecting part of it, because that's always gonna be a great sales point, and it does make something special and beautiful that people want to own, 
but we're also still always going to have that um, the cost effective, the ease of download. Like if I want to get any of you guys' books and there's a digital version out there that I can get from you, I can just get it. Same for music. I can download yeah. music, you know, yes, like you it's almost instantaneous. And then like, I can try it out and say, Oh, I, I like this. I'll now get the whole album or I'll get the graphic novel or I'll get the whole library in a bundle or whatever, you know. This may be going so, down a different road, but but I along the same lines, I see it in my children. I've seen it in you know other younger generations. Being I'm only, I'm 41, you know, so so I have a there's some younger people, <laughs> and I'm only a year but, younger. Yeah, nice and uh, happy 40. Don't worry, you'll all be older then. <laughs> But I, 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 do, I do see the way my daughter interacts with the screen at seven years old. And there's certain things that she wants to use the screen for. And I, I think part of it is about educating generations or trying to be a proponent for something. You know, screens do not need to take over every aspect of our lives. That sort of needs to stop in some way. I know I see Justin, you sugar there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear you, but they they don't need to, and and I don't think they will because uh, honestly, I mean, I see my kids coming out of the room; they're not here now, but you know, they're on the iPad for certain things. But when Lyra wants to read a book, she goes and gets a book. Yeah. I realize my experience is different from other people's experience, but I think that's a pretty common experience. We're talking about this tactile thing about books and turning pages. That's why they had to create a whole nook that looked like a book page. Oh, yeah. You and know. also the value of turning off from digital. Like if you work and look at screens all day, you do want to do things. Like I know, like I do stuff specifically that's analog for fun and entertainment uh, just to not look at computers and screens because mm -hmm. I'm on that stuff a lot, you know. And that's where I think the strength of like comic books. I mean, look at the whole board game industry. Like that's really taken an uptick. And that's even before COVID and all this stuff happened. Like that people were doing a lot more game nights and things like that. Um, so Have you ever created anything in the VR space? Like virtual? Oh, in VR? Uh, yeah. Have you no. Anything uh, I've played around what, what, with my- uh, That's sorry, an interesting what, question. Is that the future? What is the question? Yeah. Have either one of you created, done any creations via VR? Um, no, no, so no creations from, from our perspective. I can tell you that um, the position that I uh, left to start Battleborn Comics uh, was for one of the top five Department of Defense um, uh, consulting groups in the world. Wow. Um, and there are some very interesting um, virtual reality gaming opportunities that could quickly work their way into the everyday uh, lives of people who are interested in that in well, uh, doing something special. I got I got the PlayStation VR right over there and the fucking yeah. paint, paintbrush fucking game. Yeah, I can get the uh, get a little little Friday night and put that motherfucker on. Get it's all just, Jackson Pollock. I'm standing in the middle of some bullshit I've been painting in my basement for the past <laughs> hour. It's blowing my fucking. Mind. So so <laughs> no, so I'll tell blown. you I'll tell you that uh, that there are certain things that I'm not uh, I'm not at liberty to say. But oh. what I will tell you is that uh, based on some of my experiences, what you are dealing with with a PlayStation VR pales in comparison to what oh, is on the horizon. I'm, I'm there there are some too, things yeah. coming that could uh, revolutionize to almost to the point that I would I would say uh, we live in a simulation. Ah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, that, that's a lot. But, but I, I, I you, could, you could look at the situation and go. Wow, what I thought was possible, this is uh, far exceeds every aspect of what I assume the capability. Well, that's all the simulation theory is, is basically that technology increasing to the point where you can't distinguish between it and actual reality. 
That's so you, you, you don't want to walk me off in a conspiracy theory oh, concept oh God. because it, I am a conspiracy theorist. Basilisk. I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you on here until midnight if that's where we're going. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy. It's just honest to God, like. Well, it's a different way to look at consciousness. I mean, yeah. how can you possibly define consciousness? Well, you know, here's another <laughs> subset that we do have to think of with that VR stuff, right? Yeah, let me finish. Hey, Justin, yeah, finish. All I'm saying here is it's just, it's super simple. If we have virtual reality now, yeah. it continues to increase in quality, which it will, as long as we continue to increase technology, as long as that's a given factor, then there will become a point where it is inevitable that our ability to simulate reality will be indistinguishable from the reality we live in today. And if that is the case, how can we prove that it hasn't already fucking happened? That's what the simulation theory is. Absolutely. I, I'm very familiar okay. with simulation theory and also yep. you <laughs> also we could have a whole separate conversation for days about awesome. that bad boy. I love it. I think it's fascinating. Honestly I do. I love talking about these yeah. concepts. What is what the hell is consciousness? I love what's it. The, what's yeah. the next step as far as like you know deep what's the deviant art in the VR world for artists to create in that 3D space? What's that? You know, where's that next step well, Basically, it's like Ready Player One. You just sit there in a virtual <laughs> studio with virtual paints for yeah. hours, virtually painting yeah. something. It's really right. funny because I think um, the interesting thing about VR, which I we kind of neglect at times, is uh, people will be on these sort of like three D treadmills. Like, so when you want to play a game like Call of Duty, right? You'll get your virtual VR rifle, and then you'll you know, yeah. get your VR armor, but you'll armor still have to physically armor. run around. So yeah. then you'll have to get in good physical shape. Like you guys are in the military. You guys know what drilling with a heavy pack and carrying all that gear and guns are. Well, you know, those little gamer nerds don't know that. Like they, like <laughs> suddenly they're going to either be the most buff creatures on the face of the earth, or we're not going to do those types of games. They're going to be like a different sort of, experience like we it's, just it's simulate really funny. feelings of that movement without you actually doing the movement just neural stimulation that's all it is just like they have the oh right well i mean that's you know, body that's, yeah that, i mean that's like when you get like more and more built into like it's all just you know coming as the yeah, sensory neural. from your brain you know so which yeah. is which is really yeah i mean again it's it's what is reality the ultimate you know well, the, no, ultimate the question is though like platform wise as far as like a consumer space, like DeviantArt is currently what it is. What is that equivalent in the VR community? Oh, I think artists, it really like, will be very art. much like a Ready Player One Oasis type of world where you port in and you yeah. hang out with your VR friends. I mean, look at a game like um, like Rust, right? Or There's like Call like of Duty for creators. Where, or Star Wars Battlefield, right? You yeah. can go into these environments and your mission is like, oh no, you, you create a team and then you guys are going to go do like the equivalent of like D&D &D missions. But you don't have to even do those missions if you really don't want to. Like you right. can hang out in the cantina and just drink and watch Han Solo come in or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that's real popular. A lot though, of though, yeah, yeah. Though, though the last of us forces you into a storyline narrative, like just yeah. the world that they created in that is like, you, you can literally just bury yourself in that and feel like you were living that life. A there couple of the more communities. recent Resident Evils are very similar. Yeah, there are VR communities that are outside of games, though, that are just social communities. Where yeah, like Webtoons is, is pretty close to that as far as the comic book world. Mm -hmm. um, it? But I don't... Webtoons? Webtoons, okay. Um, but I don't think there's any kind of immersive comics at, that I know of yet. Um, I mean, it would be an interesting um, idea, but I think that would take it more into the computer programming world than the traditional artist world. And I mean, you would have to actually create programs and everything for an artist to use if you're going to have that kind of thing. Well, I mean, aren't you using programs that are digital art now? 
same thing for the 3D space. I'm sure there's a market for it. I'm sure, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, where's the social community where you can go view other other artists' creations in a, a VR space? Mm. Where is that social hub? You know I'm, I mean? I'm unfamiliar with where that location is, Justin, but but that the concept of that, the idea of what that is, is very interesting to me. That's <laughs> like I've not seen anywhere where that's the where that's the case. I've, it's I've, I've the natural progression. Do you, yeah, do you think that's where it's headed though? Do you not see yeah, that? I mean, I could absolutely see where that's headed. And I mean, um because you can go to a stand up show right now and be a like a legit yeah. stand-up show. Mm -hmm. And sit next to people that you can see their avatar and the, there's a real fucking comedian telling jokes and, you know, it's fucking crazy. That, I mean, it's, that's where we are. Nobody wants to see each other. But in the classical music realm, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, you, you can attend classical concerts in VR. Yeah. I mean, it's well, crazy. So, so, Justin, I, there, there are, yeah, there are absolutely communities where people go spend time together, um, where they have like-minded concepts and ideas, but I don't know that there's one specifically for creators. And I think that I if there different. was one that was very specifically oriented toward that, it'd be very interesting. Yeah, I don't know if there would be a huge appeal for it because like, I mean, if you're talking about going to a concert or going to a stand-up show, that is that person delivering that to you uh, with their own. But like, if you're talking about like comic book creation as an artist, if a if a VR guy was just watching me draw, um, I mean, I would I, watch I could, it, but <laughs> yeah, I, I could see it drawing an audience, but not like a huge market to where people are like, oh, it. Unless you're talking about like an actual immersive comic that you could walk around in while they're creating it, and I mean that that is a very cool concept. That's a, real, that's a cool ass concept that we have not discussed. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait, ah, this is a million dollar idea. <laughs> Discuss. Sandbox type. Split the profits. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's all you guys. You, you guys are the creators. <laughs> that could be kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, a create your own story esque market. Well, I mean, where... if, if you're a gamer, you understand that concept. The whole modded maps, the, you know, that whole concept is basically what it is. Yeah, but there's got to be a VR related scenario to that. Is all I'm saying. Like for right. the comic world, for the you know whatever, there's got to be an VR equivalent for it, and that's got to be a big market. Because I honestly, this is what we're doing right now. I don't want you milkers in my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, trust point. us, we can't come I'm home. Just, I'm just saying you'd be breathing all up in my spaces, and I don't appreciate that. Give us a few months. Give us a few months. But <laughs> I already is, had COVID. We're good. We can move that, on. That, that is what makes VR so appealing and and really like like Microsoft Surface, the, the even augmented reality stuff they're doing. It, that shit's fucking amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm really excited about that shit. Yeah. I want to walk around. As, as you should be. I think everyone should be excited about it. I think it's something that's going to change everything for every artist. And hopefully, if it's done properly, it will give artists some control over the art that they actually create. Because unfortunately, we live in a society right now, and I'm getting really off <laughs> here. But <laughs> Justin left. <laughs> but, but, but artists are not paid what they should be paid. Our artists create and work just as hard as everyone else, and they are often just not paid for their art. And it's, art it's harder in some cases, it, harder. much harder in some cases because our, the art life is, I mean, it's a life that you, in some ways, like many people don't choose it. It's inevitable for them. As a young kid, they recognize that, wait, this is what I want to do, and I have to find a way to make it work, and we inevitably find ourselves in situations that we can't control, you know? We just count on society to let the cream rise to the top. That's they, 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 as a, I probably seem or will sound like the, oh yeah, this is the guy that says it all the time. But I'm, I'm telling you guys right now, if if there ever comes a point in in our the Battleborn Comics space where we hit it big, 
there, there is absolutely not a shadow of a doubt on my mind that Robin will be compensated in a like, way yeah. that is yeah. that is kind of, that is kind of some of the work he's put in. I, I literally have been writing two lines of dialogue or scene development that he then spends days pining over to create panels and the framework and the design. Uh, there, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, that what he is putting in is significantly uh, more more uh, on a higher level than anything that I'm putting into the framework of the story. And uh, well, I, I, I that way. respond, Robin. Yeah, yeah, I, I, like I, I think they're more harmonious than anything. So, like, I wouldn't be able to create that scene if it weren't for Chad's words. Um, he writes very descriptively, so it's very easy for me to translate. Um, and like, so like with Prodigy, it's a little different because that's, that's my story that Chad's helping me put the words to. So I already know how I want it to look. Yeah. And yeah, Chad's just fun. helping me oh. insert the dialogue and everything. And he, he does an excellent job at it. And, uh, it, 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 when me and Chad got together, it, it, it kind of blew my mind on how the whole comic creation stuff worked. Cause uh, we did quite a bit of research and everything, growing pains on how to actually create a comic book. Um, so it took us a little while. And, and then once we got in the rollout, like uh, we were we were kind of cautious about like bringing anybody else in. And like there, there was a point where we brought another artist in and I kind of stepped back um, to try to get the ball rolling a little more because I'm still active duty army and you know uh, currently we, you are yeah yeah there, yeah I would love to get into that a little bit too going on piece I, I left after 12 years Ryan so our whole yeah. framework is designed around that Very yeah weird. but uh, the fact that Chad has has written these stories and like he can write a story in a few days for for an issue yeah. but it'll take me a month to draw it so that's kind of a drawback for for us as a fledgling company and like i i welcome other artists like wholeheartedly to take something off my plate um because you have to choose you have to choose correctly i mean you, you have to yeah. have an artist that is in tune with your vision you know. Yeah, and and artists, uh, and I know you said that they don't get paid, but comic book artists uh, that we have found that have, so you either have a really talented artist that knows what he's worth, and we're paying upwards to two grand for 15 pages of art, or you get a mediocre artist that doesn't know what he's worth, and we're only paying a couple hundred dollars, but he's also sketchy. Um, and so we've run into both those situations and it, it's kind of a heartache. That's why I'm, I'm very happy to have Chad. Um, and I'm, I'm sure he's happy to have me because we're both in this together. and It's like a zero sum um, financial gain right now, but we're, we're both doing what we love. So, I think that's part of it is like, like, I, like I said previously, I, I think a lot of artists don't realize what they're worth and, <clears throat> Uh, so how do we support the artistic community? Tell them, no, you're, you're good at what you do. <laughs> Just don't be a dick about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ryan, Ryan, I think at the, at the start of that as a, as a writer stepping into, because I don't, I don't qualify writing as art in my well, I do. I do. We're, we're, we're very mathematical as it pertains to what works and what makes sense. Uh, I think that the words that I put on paper are – decent uh they pay there were composers though people that i work with but i but i would tell you that like as it pertains to what i put on paper as it uh from a writing perspective and what robin puts on paper from a, an artistic perspective we're not in the same league it's different <laughs> very different fair enough fair enough and, yeah. my and, ultimate I type band. It and i respect it and i think i think anyways that's that's what makes us work is that uh, in a lot of cases, there are people who think that their writing somehow supersedes the art. 
There are writers in this world that are very egotistical and think that they are something way better than what they actually are. There's so I, many I artists that are, yeah. Yeah, I, pr I promise you that I, I recognize from day one that I could not be where I am and cannot grow to where I want to go without a guy like Robin. And that's literally why uh, the two of us make the perfect partnership. I, I don't ever um, regret or worry uh, that I am making a mistake and being in this relationship. See, we, we we all have our loves. We all have the artists, our, our primary influencers in life. But we also, as artists, we surround ourselves with people that are close to us, that are in our community, that we also love equally, who we admire. And, yeah. and, and as long as you don't approach your own art with ego and are able to collaborate, then you can create a fruitful process. A million percent. And I, and I think wow. we've done a great job of that over the last year, to, a year and some change now, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we started this before, the, before COVID hit, yeah. right? And we've, yeah. been, we've been plugging away. Things have gone amazing. Uh, but, but what I would say, uh, Ryan, in, in all honesty, is I think that uh, it, it, just in reference to what you said, hey, how do you ensure that artists are treated effectively and I think first and foremost is like you have to understand what they are bringing to the table that exceeds in some cases what you are bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. ego, thing. E ego is something that is such a huge failure in the world of business. And as a, as a brand new company, right, we came out in 2020, but we've been together since 2019. Um, one thing that I recognize, I, I was a college wrestler. I've done a lot of very successful business ventures, and I spent 12 years as an infantry soldier in the Army and was very successful uh, in that realm as well. One of the things that has consistently allowed me to be successful in the spaces I step into is understanding there are things that I don't know, and I need to know that I don't know those things. If I walk in and say, well, I'm the big man on campus and I know everything and I'm going to tell you how it goes. and this is You're going to fail. You're, you're, you're going to fail. Yeah. Because you're going to be surrounded by people who do not have a belief in you because they know that you have flaws you're unwilling to like own up to. Mm -hmm. As it pertains to me and Robin, I defer to Robin on a regular basis because I say, I wrote some stuff. I think it's good. I hope it's good, but you're more familiar with the space in some capacity than I am. Tell me if you think what I've put on paper uh, constitutes something we should put out into the world. And Robin is the, really the guy who looks at my writing on paper and says, I'm the artist. I think this belongs. What he wrote here does not belong. These are the things that look right. These are the things that look off based on my understanding of the industry, the people, the world. It, as he draws a panel, it's not Robin sketches a panel just off, you know, a, a brand, a random fucking no. concept. Robin is sketching shit off of, here's what I know about the industry. Here's what I saw from, you know, Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby and the historical framework of the comic world. Here's what makes sense from a panel draw out perspective. Here is, he has a multitude of things that, that he puts on. Really? So, um, I was trying to ask Tom, I mean, yeah. It's nice that we all have people to hold our hands, but Tom, you seem like you're a pretty solo guy. Is anybody holding your hand? Or you've been solo, and like, why have you decided to do that? And Tom. And... <laughs> okay, okay uh, Tom will be back. Hey. There, hey, he's back. Tom's there. Oh, the internet loves me and hates me. It's great. It's fucking AOL. I sent Tom a Zoom link to his AOL email. Yeah. So his dial-up has something to do with it. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably rocking a 48.4K modem from uh, US hey, right now. You know? Tom, you sound great. You sound great. Did you hear my question, Tom? Uh, no. What was the question? 
Okay. Basically, we all have people holding our hands. Do you have somebody holding your hand? It seems like you're solo, dude. And what uh, what made you do that and stay that way? Well, uh, I guess it goes back to that sort of uh, larger conversation of if you, if the writer and artist are in sync, it's like a you know it's like a Paul and John sort of scenario in the Beatles. Uh, but if not, it's the lead guitar versus the the lead singer. Like you can have a lot of personality clashes and battles. Yeah. That um, you know, uh, you're absolutely you know, they, right. They are hard to resolve when it's just a partnership, right? Like if you so have a you neutral have third party, you can settle it because the editor will say, "This is the book. This is what you got to do. You did this part. That person did that part. Oh, they made a decision that serves the story better. We're going with that, right? Like you know, which is." Uh, a good way to do it. For me, um, you know, I collaborate a lot with a lot of different um, people for different jobs and projects. Uh, the reason I did my book myself was that I really wanted to make the book that I really wanted to make and draw and do, as opposed to somebody else's, like, hey, I got a really cool book that I've always wanted to do. Now I need an artist to do it. Like, no, this is, this was what I wanted to do. Like, like right. my book is essentially, you know, Bruce Lee meets the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, yeah. Can it's you like hold that, hold that up again? I always yeah. wanted to do. You know, right. It's the yeah, yeah, whole story I always sort of wanted to do, you know, but, but. Can I know, actually look at the binding? Gonna get the... Oh, yeah, Sure. Is it Can you? I, I'm actually a bookmaker as well. That's. I'm just curious what what the spine looks like. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Is that hardcover, Tom? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. What's up? Is that hardcover? Yeah. I, I mean, love that it. gets That's back beautiful. to the conversation about like preciousness that we were talking about earlier, about like what people like comic book. What comic book fans like to buy, they do like the hardcover books. Um, really? Also, from like shipping standpoint, it's yeah, like they they love the shelf porn. They like uh, a solid hardcover book. Uh, they like a story that's sort of all in one if they can get it that way. Um, that's why this is like it's an original graphic novel. More will happen in the series, but when you get this, you get a beginning, middle, and end, and it's. Um, uh, sort of like uh, when you watch a TV show and that first episode is that two-part movie to sell you on the series, that's really what, like, what I was doing in the, in the book. Like, you get the whole idea of, like, what's going on, what the person's world is, and then the further adventures come in the following, you know, issues afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, from a shipping standpoint, it's great because the books are more durable. They're actually not like this 128 page hardcover book. Um, it's probably like I said, like sent me the mail. It's that, you know, it's yeah. like I think something like four dollars, four dollars and a quarter to send off, like all packaged up. So, you know. Is it bound? With, is it bound with glue on the end, or, or are they you know, are they stitched? For me, I just did it all myself. Well, I didn't do it all myself. I hired uh, Marshall Dillon. He's a letterer for pretty much everybody, but he also has done a lot of stuff for DC Comics. He's a guy I know, like just somebody I know from my area, and I know he did good work. And so he was a person who was helping, I guess, to sort of check my math. In that, like, uh, you know, obviously when someone's doing the lettering for you, any typos, you know, they'll catch stuff and then you'll catch stuff because you go back and forth looking that way. But other than that, I could have other people read over the script, uh, a few close friends, just to um, not give me story feedback, but give me sort of a, a sense of, like, can they follow along what's happening? Because, like, honestly, 
I like this one. Um, I, I love other people's opinions and, and they're all valid. Oh yeah, like that was um I like that, that a lot. one of the pinups that's in the book. I got yeah, I got like about 20 some guest artists, like indie artists and pro artists that I know to uh, do artwork for me in the book. So mm -hmm. at the back section, there's uh, a gallery and in the gallery is a whole bunch of different people. Uh, J.K. Woodward, Brett Weldley, a whole bunch of other folks. And uh, all these folks, they provided, uh, they were great enough to actually do a piece of art for me uh, to go in the book, which is super helpful because that's more people's names attached to a project. And uh, also it's a nice little platform to give some of my friends a shout out, you know, for just what they're doing and stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of a logistical nightmare though, because <laughs> you're juggling like 20 some artists who take literally forever. Like they didn't just fruit, like I had two people who didn't just freak out. They disappeared off the face of the earth for a year. There is a stereotype a here to contend with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's true though. Like, there's a reason why it's a stereotype because it happens. Like, no, I mean, as a composer, I, person, I, I, was like, well, I, guess I mean, full disclosure, I've been known to flake out sometimes too, but, but also, uh, you know, as a composer putting ensembles together, <clears throat> large ensembles, I'd have musicians flake out all the time. And it's, just, it's something that I had to contend with. It's something that I actually planned for to a certain extent, because you sort of have to. You know, oh, my bassoonist is going to drop out. Oh, I better have another one lined up. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's <laughs> not those bassoonists. It's start really a worry in there for a second. <laughs> I always got a backup bassoonist, you know? <laughs> hey, I love the bassoon. I write for the bassoon all the time. Yeah. Fucking speed dial that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny stuff, but I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, the reason I just went solo was it just be efficient, you know, just, just efficient for me. Yeah. And really to do the type of book that I want to do, because I wanted to do uh, a very action-driven, um, you know, 80s style, Enter the Ninja, Bruce Lee meets the Incredible Hulk book. And uh, that's not the most literary heavy lifting like, like, it's a cool, it's a cool revenge story, and there's a plot and, and story, and, and I assure you, it all makes sense. But a lot of times, there's material uh, there. You know, if you're a writer, you want to come from it from like I want to engage the reader so much deeper mentally, right? Um, I'll tell as you one thing to like me, who like I want to draw really cool stuff. You know? No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, uh, just to interject again, uh, the, the three of you gentlemen, I, the one thing that I'm really impressed about is that your artistic vision is never put on hold. Uh, I really admired that in artists. I mean, you, you have to find the game that you want to play in order to get your art out. That's vital for an artist. But, you know, sacrificing your vision is something that I don't think any artist should have to do ever. You know, and the fact that the three of you are doing that to some extent, I mean, is pretty encouraging to see. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Uh, from my perspective, this oh, yeah. is something that uh, we, we have had to take some creative liberties as it pertains to mm -hmm. creation. Uh, you know, we started out specific Battleborn comics, we're doing comic book stuff. But as time continued to progress, we eventually got to a point where we were like, maybe we should look into the production realm, the television realm, the feature realm. And we started writing screenplays and kind of tweaking the initial concept to incorporate some other aspects of the world. And um, had that not been the case, we never would have stumbled into... Uh, you know, two screenwriting competitions uh, that we won and uh, and really seen some super positive and exciting uh, uh, progress uh, as it pertains to a life beyond comics. Comics, uh, you know, I think about the Robert Kirkman model. 
And, you know, he writes Walking Dead. He writes a few other projects. He's kind of struggling, a Kentucky kid looking for a way to get out there. I was and, a Kentucky uh, kid, too. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Southern, Southern Indiana. You know. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I live in Colorado now, but, you know. Nice. Uh, whereabouts? I live in Fort Collins right now, I, I, but I, yeah. I, I work in Boulder. Fantastic. Oh, I actually went to the Air Force Academy when I was working with Under Armour. To do oh, something. dude, I, I've been down there many times. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. I that, love it. It's beautiful. So gorgeous. Garden of the Gods. We spent oh, a little bit of time. The time. We, we hiked. We hiked there early in the morning before we went to uh, run some. Uh, I was the lead trainer for some of the stuff that was going on over there. So I did a, an awesome little uh, Sean T style microphone. <laughs> uh, hey, we're all doing our workout stuff, guys. The, the, the trail system they have there, Garden of Gods. I mean, come on, it's yeah. like, excellent for running. Absolutely. Fuck yeah! Oh, okay. So, okay. So, so, so let me ask, uh, Tom. Tom, are you military too? Yeah. So, all no, three of you. No. no, no. Well, I mean, still, please, please feel free to like jump in here. But, but I am really curious about how your military careers have influenced your art, because I think that that might be a common misconception among. Yeah, do a PTSD line, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I read that in the bio. And yeah, so so I, so I I would like to hear about how your personal. You don't have to get personal with your experiences unless you want to, but you know, because because I I think a lot of, I mean, I, I say this as a liberal myself, but but I think a lot of liberals don't get it. You know, they don't necessarily understand that that you know community of any kind is a community that uh, propagates art and propagates artful thinking. And so I, I wonder like how like your experience in your military career has affected your art. Well, like, and, and directly. To, I, I wouldn't lump the military. So the military is probably one of the most diverse um, organizations. It is in America. So and I believe that. We're, yeah. We're super diverse in um, religions, race, mm -hmm. and political affiliations. So a lot of my really close friends in the military have liberal ideologies. And yeah. you know, there's there's no issue with it until you start getting like into the news. Until and the media people, gets in the way. Yeah. And I agree media, with that. The media is doing a very horrible and that disingenuous job of trying to pit everybody against each other. 100%. But uh, speaking from uh, the, the military standpoint on how it's uh, kind of, um, it hasn't influenced so much of my art um, as far as, you know, the styles I draw in or anything like that, but it's just kind of in a mental acuity to adapt to a situation. So if Chad needs me to draw more of like Sandman-esque um, pictures rather than X-Men or Todd McFarlane pictures, um, my my base style is, is kind of that of... Um, you know, a, a very base comic book style, but I can um, kind of flutter it up in in ways to match the story he's telling. So, like, my art style for Hath No Fury is is wholly different than my art style for Progeny, um, and then some of the stuff that uh, that I, I drew for um, Subpar is completely different from both of those. It's more of a like very kiddish Disney-esque kind of kind of thing. So I mean uh, the styles uh, they vary and I think that the military helped me be more adaptive and not put myself in this one box where I'm like I draw like this and no other way is in any way shape or form acceptable. So mm military has shaped me. Now, the stories we tell are very much um, kind of inspired by the military. 
Um, they touch on PTSD. Yeah, that's what I hear about. And uh, they, like, uh, a, a lot of issues that the military deals with that people don't really, like, they wouldn't really see from, like, an outside person. <laughs> like, we're, we are, uh, I don't want to say we're a lot softer than people give us credit for, but, I mean, we are. Yeah. That's a good-looking kitty. I, I sent that to Chad, but that, but the, I meant that for everyone. <laughs> Sorry, Chad. You are a good-looking kitty, but I mean, I'm also like, come on. <laughs> I got shit. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Everyone. I got shit real bad. Yeah, I'm probably actually going to have to jump off here in a little bit. I still have to. Uh... Yeah, we got to go, bro. It's two, we're two hours, fifteen minutes, and I got shit. Something fierce. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I've been leaning up in my desk, you know what I mean? Like there's no shame, no shame whatsoever. This is starting to get the poop sweats. Yeah, I'm surprised um, it hasn't started beating with little anticipation sweat. Life of the yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> we we can definitely uh schedule a part two for this. Uh I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, did your pleasure, man. Oh, thanks, man. Your, uh, dial up it, you know what I mean? Like I'm no. down to you whenever as well. <laughs> Tom, do you do you have an email where we can reach out to you? I would love to keep up with you, brother. You're you're killing it out here. Uh, yeah, I'll drop it in the chat here for you guys. Here. Fantastic. That's awesome. Uh, what you guys are doing is beautiful. All three of you, I love it, and I can't wait to look for more. Yeah, thanks for like talking about it, showing me your shit. Yeah. Some way and but what what's the best way to get a hard copy of it? I didn't see the. Oh, the um, best way to get um, the hard copy. Well, there's okay. There's two ways. The best way is if you go to uh, Tom Kelly Etsy uh, Art .com. That's my Etsy store, and you can order a copy there. If you want to um, look more like the interior pages and find out more information about the actual book itself, you can go to the Kickstarter page, and at the top of the page. There's a link where you can order the book uh, there as well. So you get like, you know, both are fine. Um, but if you do want to explore a little bit more and see more info about the book itself, I would say go to the Kickstarter page, uh, Kickstarter. which is Foot Fist Frankenstein yeah, at kickstarter.com. Yeah, I'm missing. And, uh, is that oh, right? yeah, you can always get. Yeah, you can get them signed and all that stuff. You just have to, you know, message me and, and just let me know and, you know, all that fun stuff. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then there's like the order there at the top. She's a poking boys. I guess the runs. <laughs> all right. Well, Better boys. Pitter patter. Have a great night, guys. Battleborn Battle Comics. Time, guys. All right. Yeah. Later, fellas. Have a Peace great night, fellas. Yep. Yep. <laughs> We're going through a reenactment of that. Holy shit! I'll just take one! <laughs> <laughs>